Tell me about moderation. I don't need that crap here. Give people a few minutes to get in here. Uh, we are going to basically go through some babies. I got to clean some tubs. So you get to watch me clean some snakes while I uh, show off the babies. As always, my lighting in here is terrible. So you guys who have been here before are prepared for that. You guys who are new to this, we'll see how bad it is. Uh, I live in an eternal house of darkness. Not only has electric skyrocketed here, but uh, it's just I'm in an older house that I rent and there are no lighting fixtures uh, from above anywhere in the house except for the kitchen. Uh, every other room is, is lamps or something installed on the wall. So lighting is a bit of a problem. You can see Ronnie Burgundy up there is deep in shed. Just happened to notice uh, she's sitting front and center. So give this a minute, let some people get in, and then we'll start going through some babies. Um, depending on how long we spend on individual babies, I'll try to get through most of them. I did notice uh, quite a few of the Sumatrans are going through shed cycles right now. Uh, so if they are in shed and they're not dirty, what's going on, Dom? Uh, I'm not going to bother, uh, you know, dragging them out for no reason. So the few Sumatrans that are in shed, I'll skip. Um, Trying to think if there's any other babies in shed right now. I know one of the bloods are, I just went through all the babies maybe two or three days ago. Those of you that follow me on Instagram uh, probably saw pretty much every single baby because I tried to um, take a, a picture or a video of just about every single one when I was cleaning. So I'm pretty sure I got the majority of them on there. So in the interest of time and for people that are watching this later, we are gonna get rolling. Uh, so we'll start off maybe with some Borneo short tails here. We'll start off in this rack. This particular girl is, is clean uh, from the other day, so I really don't have to do anything here. Um, this is from the Callisto and Atlas Clutch. Uh, this is a side swipe female. That was a side swipe to side swipe pairing. Uh, the one thing about this clutch, and you might notice with some of these babies, including her, is some of them have a little bit of kind of funky head movement. And... Uh, now, technically speaking, the parents of this clutch are half siblings. So there is some, um, you know, line breeding there, but not enough to where I think that would affect this. And there are no known issues within side swipe to think that side swipe to side swipe would have caused it. Uh, what I did have happen this year, though, was my incubator did kind of temp spike a little bit. And I have a feeling that that had something to do with it during a pivotal uh, developmental point with some of them. Um, I don't know for sure that speculation based on, you know, my experience breeding snakes and, uh, you know, having that happen. I don't know what was going on with the incubator this year. It's thermostatted, it's run, uh, you know, year in and year out, but for whatever reason this year, just really struggling to keep it cool enough, which is kind of weird. You think you're heating an incubator, but I have an older house and I have to run my air conditioning during the summer in order to keep the the um, incubator balance because what happens is over the course of the night the house will cool down the incubator runs full temp and it's so well insulated that during the day as soon as the sun comes up and hits the house the house is poorly insulated from above the house just bakes and so the incubator obviously can't cool itself it only heats itself so even though it shuts off the heat that residual is in there the temperature in the room raises and just causes it to spike so I run the air conditioning to balance it and uh, usually that's pretty good, but we had some pretty intense heat this summer where the AC just could not keep up. Uh, and uh, so I have a feeling that that's what happened there was some of that. Uh, no, I am not gonna be at the Oaks show. I'm getting ready to go to Vegas next week. So I am going to be in crisis mode this weekend, trying to get my house and animals in order so that I can travel. Um, my brother's going to be house sitting for me and he's going to be doing it for the first time. So, uh, I'm trying to have things in as good a shape for him as possible. Uh, he's going to have to have his hands full of the dogs. They're probably going to drive him nuts anyhow. So, uh, I definitely, uh, am not going to be going really anywhere this weekend. Uh, if I was going anywhere this weekend, I was going to try to get out to Dylan's. Um, it's his daughter's first birthday. And I really wanted to go, but I just, I have so much to do uh, before I go on this trip. This one's also clean here. Uh, like I said, I just went through these like two days ago. So I expect the bulk of them to be pretty reasonable. Same clutch, once again, this is a male. Uh, this one doesn't seem to have uh, the same head movement issues, uh, at least not as noticeable or as often. Um, and it seems to be hit or miss throughout the clutch, which makes it even stranger. Uh, 
you know, and um, I did split the clutch up into two egg boxes, but this male would have been in the same egg box as the previous female. She, I have, I always put them in the racks in order of hatch. Uh, so, you know, she was the first baby to hatch. He was the second baby to hatch. So they came out of the same egg box. Uh, same thing, another side swipe animal here. He is available for sale. I don't have him listed anywhere right now, uh, but he is available. Uh, really, really, really nice animal. That female is one that maybe down the line I would let go of. But with the head movement, I've been a little bit nervous about selling those animals that have that. Um, you know, I gave one from this clutch to Rob, and then uh, I sold a couple here and there that did not display that behavior. And the thing is, they're all doing fantastic. They shed great. They eat fantastic. Obviously, temperament-wise, they're they're great. I don't have any issues with these guys. This guy's about to fall. Um, you know, I mean, I can I can pretty much do what I want. They'll get a little swimmy once in a while. They're still baby Borneos, but you know, I mean, I'm holding this animal, winging it around, doing whatever I'm doing, and he's just doing his thing. You know, not paying attention to anything. Doesn't care. Uh, so really, really cool clutch here. Um, initially, my plan was actually to hold back this entire clutch because this is the first time I've done side swipe to side swipe and just, we really don't know, uh, no, you need to go back in this. We really don't know where the, the potential is there fully. Uh, so the plan was to, um, ooh, finally a dirty sink. The plan was to, uh, to hold back the whole clutch and whatever, but the people that I have sold animals to from this clutch that are side swipe uh, know the situation and I've asked them if they do pair these animals up to at least do a pairing that doesn't involve something from Sideswipe Lineage, just so we can kind of have a chance to see what's going on there. Um, my God, YouTube, I had to re-download YouTube so it keeps rolling out and acting like I'm a new YouTube member here telling me how to do everything. Happy New Year to you as well, Sean. MK Reptiles, hello. Sorry I missed some of your comments. Um, just trying to, uh, to do this. Do I have any Burmese? Uh, I do not. My berm passed away last year. He was about 18 years old, um, right? 18 when he passed. Yeah, give or take, 18, 19 in that realm. Uh, he did finally pass away, so I don't have any berms anymore. Not really a species I'm particularly passionate about. Uh, so I, I took him in as a rescue in, I believe, July of 2013 and, uh, you know, had him for... I think about eight years or so, give or take seven, eight years, whatever it was, but eight years, I guess, timeline-wise. Whoa there, killer. Uh, this is one of my females I'm keeping. You guys have probably seen her on the channel before. I'm pretty sure one of the last videos I did was uh, the holdback group. So this is the female. You can see she's a little dripping wet right now. Uh, she, uh, she definitely can't tip this sideways too much, but I think you can kind of see that's all, that's all liquid. That's all quote unquote pee, it's not technically pee, but anybody that tells you that snakes don't pass liquid has never kept short tails, I'll tell you that much because they pass a lot of it uh, and frequently. But she's really cool as well. She never uh, exhibits any of the funky head movement at all. Uh, real solid animal in every way. I just don't want her to fall. Um, you know, nice and big, big baby, uh, eats great. This whole clutch eats really, really well. There's a few babies, uh, especially there's like two that really have funky head movement. Um, they still eat great, but like I kind of have to come in from the side on them and tickle their neck with the food and then they'll turn and grab it. They're just not very accurate with their strikes. It almost, it almost, if you've kept like spider ball pythons, it reminds me a little of that. It's not the same. Um, and it's not, I don't really think it's a neurological thing. I'm going to throw her down here for a minute so I can change this. Mm. Mm -mm. You're missing out if you don't keep these snakes and how often you get to clean the same stuff over and over. And I'm not just throwing that on the floor. I have a garbage bag hanging on the thing. Normally I have a garbage can in here, but right now I have the garbage can outside from the other day. I cleaned it out. It's on the deck still, uh, washed it out and everything. I just haven't brought it back in. So I just hung a bag on my, my little cart here for now. Uh, I saw some comments go by, so let me see. Um, yeah, so I love the Bloods and Short Tails. Uh, getting a berm's awesome, but for me, you know, not being like a passion species for an animal that's going to take up a significant amount of room, um, not really something for me that's, that's worth it. 
uh, just from a space standpoint. I only have so much space. Right now my snake room is actually as open as it's been in a while, um, but it's, that's going to change probably when I come back from vacation. I have a whole new stack of Christmas tree bins I'm going to put in here and bump some stuff up that's in the ARS rack. Uh, and so once I do that, I'll have another stack over there and it'll be back to a little more clustered in here. But for right now, for a couple of weeks, I'm enjoying having a little more space in here uh, to move around and not be so cramped. And, uh, you know, ultimately my goal would be to get somewhere with a bigger snake room. I was looking at possibly moving later this year. That fell through. That's not going to work out. Um, so for now, we just got to keep, keep on keeping on with what I've got. And I just don't want to scare her. She went over behind my water jug. She's exploring the cart right now. And I, all of my babies, I keep, um, I basically keep the babies as if they're a separate collection, even though they're in the same room. So you guys will notice, like, I don't go back and forth between babies and my other animals. I always do what I need to do with the babies first. And uh, then I'll deal with the other animals after. Just kind of an extra step of uh, biosecurity, uh, especially considering. What are you doing? Are you go back in the fucking tub? Thank you. No, no, no. Sometimes they don't want to go back in. And then the funny thing is, they don't want to come out. But once they're out, they don't want to go back in. They just got to be a pain in the ass. And this is a pain with this fucking rack in my way, but I have no room in here. All right, you're really starting to piss me off now. Now I'm going to not be nice. Nope, nice is done. Nope. Ah, yeah, get mad. Get mad. I don't care. Fucking hell. She is often like this. She's just a pain in the ass every time going back in. Oh, fucking hell, dude. And I can't, like, do anything. If I push too hard, I'll slam her head in there because she just fucking shoots out. Will you just go back in the fucking bin? There we go. All right, on to the next. Uh, this one is in shed, so we'll just look at this one quick, maybe, depending on uh, how she takes it. She's a little annoyed, so we're going to do this quick. This is a cool baby, though. She kind of looks ocelot looking. Uh, same clutch, side swipe to side swipe. Obviously, she's like a real, real grayish color right now because she's in blue. Um, but really, really cool baby. This was baby number seven from this clutch. The last one I believe was baby number five. Uh, Rob, I gave four, three and six I sold. Um, so those ones are not here anymore. And all the rest of these go back in their, in their bins pretty good. Uh, this one's in shed, so she's got no clue what's going on, but it's really just my hold back one that gives me a hard time going back in. This is another one that's got a little bit of the head movement stuff going on. Just see if I missed any chats here. Um, I don't really do cleaning collection of short tails are definitely a full-time job. Yeah, for sure. And then the other snakes too I have. Um, this room is just short tails, but I, I have the olives and the, the white lip and the McLots and, uh, you know, the other stuff out there. Actually, there's one ball python in here. So technically, technically there's one more species in here. But, um, but yeah, I don't have a website or anything. I have a couple snakes listed up on Morph Market right now. I'm not really good about updating that typically. Um, a lot of times my Instagram story, I'll post stuff that's available on there. Uh, the paid YouTube members get first dibs on anything that I put up for sale. So there's a, a private area where they always get to view everything first uh, before I put it up for sale anywhere else. And they also get uh, a little bit of a discount on stuff usually as well. Um, in most cases, unless it's like a hold back release kind of thing or whatever, but everything else they get a little discount on. Uh, so this is the next baby, baby number eight. This one's kind of interesting because on this side, it's like a very low expression side swipe where you can see that the side pattern wanted to kind of erase completely, but didn't quite. And then on the other side, if I can get it to turn around and not be a pain in the ass, um, <laughs> it is, you know, your more traditional side swipe where it's all wiped out. So it's kind of cool how you get two different, two different sides like that on the same baby. Um, and that right there, that movement isn't really the head movement I'm talking about. You notice it more when they like pull away. Um, of course, this one doesn't really care about much, so it's hard to get it to pull away. 
but when they pull away, they kind of just turn their head in a direction that just isn't quite normal. And this one's actually balanced out a little bit more as it's aged too. When it was really little, I noticed it more and during feeding I see it, but um, seems to be balancing out with a little bit of size and age. But cool baby, this one is one that I probably would make available. I haven't listed anywhere yet, um, but you know, if I found the right person for this one, this, this is a great, great snake. Uh, it's dirty too, so let's clean it real quick. And a little of that. Where are you going? Off exploring the cart. But um, yeah, so I, I've got this trip going on. I'm going out to Vegas for about a week. Um, and uh, looking forward to that. Got some stuff going on out there that'll hopefully be exciting. And uh, I'm always happy to get a break from work. Work is getting pretty grueling lately. Um, with some stuff going on there. Not gonna get into that because not the time or place, but just uh, definitely getting annoyed with some stuff going on there. So I should pick up on the car, get a little piece of dirt. Put this one back and get on to the next one. The next one's another one of my holdbacks, um, which I think might be in shed. Oh. I can't tell. It's clean, so we don't have to clean this one. No, I don't think it's in shed. So this is another one that I'm definitely keeping. Uh, this one, I believe, also is a female. Oh, my brain's fried. I'm pretty sure this is a female. I think the next one is the male I'm keeping for sure. Um, but nice, another nice side swipe. Really hit a lot of side swipe on this clutch with the side swipe to side swipe thing. Definitely more frequent within this clutch than it is just doing side swipe to something else. Uh, where normally you see like half the clutch. This one's been, been a lot more. Uh, happy Friday, Junior. Oh, because it's Thursday. I got you. Yeah, I'll definitely let you know, Dom, um, uh, if I'm going to be able to do it. I'm going to get in the 19th. I forget what time my flight gets in, but I got to get my uh, stuff. But I know you're out of town or something, I think, part of the time that I'm there. So I'll have to try to do it probably the day I get there or the day after, depending on my schedule. Oh, dirty. Dirty, dirty. Come here. What, are you in a mood? I don't care. Call someone who cares. So this is, uh, I believe this one is the male that I'm keeping. It could be wrong and it could be the other one. I always switch the two, um, but I have a trio, one male, two females. This one, the color doesn't really show in my lighting, but this one's got really cool hues and really clean swiping. I mean, just an incredible animal. It's almost got like a honey ghost kind of coloration to it. Where are you going? Um, just really great animals. Really cool snake. Very excited about this one. And I think you could probably see the size difference from the female, the one that didn't want to go back in the tub. She was just born big and just has taken off size-wise. There's like three or four in this clutch that are just huge compared to the rest. And it's not that anybody's eating more or less. They just blew up. I think you can see a little bit kind of of some of that, like like the honey ghost, almost that kind of hue. Um, it doesn't show up as much on here as it would in person. But let me uh, clean this one real quick. This one's, I don't even think this one's dirty. I think this is more spilled water than anything. Um, but yeah, no, I like, I like this clutch a lot. And in this year, like a lot of the babies I hatched are really, really cool. I've had probably, one of the worst years I've ever had as far as like troubled babies with stuff not wanting to feed to start and, and just a lot of fail to thrives. Most seasons I probably have, you know, one or two fail to thrives. This year I'd say I had probably eight to 10. Now I did have a, a larger portion of babies this year, but just percentage wise, it was, it was definitely much higher than normal. Um, so was that because of the incubator issue? Was it something else? You know, that'll remain to be seen as we move forward. Um, I'm hoping it was just a fluke. I saw some other people had kind of fluke seasons. So hopefully it was just something like that. 
And I, I've, I've seemed to notice if you pay attention and we, you know, who knows what phenomenon it is. Is it because you're paying more attention because things happen to you? But it seems like there's certain cycles where no matter where people are in the country, no matter how they're doing things, things seem to be going the same within their collections. Um, same issues, you know, you'll see years where everybody has incubation issues, years where everybody's got other issues going on. And it's just really bizarre how that seems to happen. I think this is a, no, that's not food, that's my hand. This one. This one can be a little swimmy at times. All wet was sitting partially in its water. Um, but obviously another side swipe. I forget if this one's male or female. Um, I think this clutch was pretty female heavy. So my guess is probably a female. Um, but just a cool baby. And uh, clean it real quick while we're talking. But uh, really, really happy with how this worked out. I would do this pairing again. And I'd especially like to do it again and kind of control the variables a little bit better. And that would give me a better understanding of, you know, obviously if I control everything and there's still a problem, then you know it's something else. I just, I really don't think it is. I don't see any reason why um, these issues would be heritable and be something that was genetics based as opposed to situational. So make sure that baby doesn't take off and go flying over the side. Anybody that keeps short tails or bloods in general can tell you they have no regard for their own safety. They will throw themselves right off of things, get hurt. They just don't really pay attention very well at all. Why, I don't know. Just seems to be a thing with them more than a lot of other species that I've kept. Oh, hey, good. You're clean. I like clean. You also look like you're headed into shed. Come here, we'll just hold you out quick. So this one's going into shed, so real dull here as well. You can see a little of that head movement in this baby. Um, it's not a lot of them, but it's definitely some of them and noticeable enough in enough of them that, you know, I was aware of it. I sent some videos to some people and they didn't notice it, but I notice it because I'm like always looking for it, I guess. Like you can see it right there, just kind of that little squirreliness. There you go. It's just not the way short tails normally pull back and normally turn and, and things like that. All right, we're still in the same clutch here and another one going into shed. Come on real quick. So this one's also in shed. Uh, another side swipe, really cool animal. I wish they weren't all going into shed so you could actually see the coloration a little better because now they look really grayish, bluish. You can just kind of see the smokiness of the body as it's going into shed. I'm not restricting the snake's head either. It's just chilling like that. Um, but uh, but yeah, so you're, you're seeing a lot of these guys in shed. That's at least the third one in this clutch, um, if not the fourth. next oh looks like we're in shed here too you guys all in the same cycle or what another another side swipe going into shed um, I want to say there was 16 babies in this clutch altogether um, no fail to thrives in this clutch nothing's passed everything's done great um, so go figure the clutch that I have you know, the incubation issue with that, that or what I think is an incubation issue is the clutch that has zero problems. Uh, my blood python clutch this year had zero problems as well. Uh, those, those two, everybody's done great. Um, thrive just fine, no, no problems there. Yeah, here, this one doesn't look like it's in shed. I think this is the last baby from this clutch. This one definitely, you'll see the head movement in, um, just the way it's moving around. Let me see if I can get it to pull back. Just as it's crawling and just the way it turns and moves, it's just like very, very different than your standard short tail. There you go, you can kind of see. 
So that's one that at this point, you know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't sell um, down the line if I find the right person. Uh, then I'll discuss that as long as that person's comfortable with it, understands what they're getting into, which is largely unknown. Um, but, uh, but for now, that one's here. Pretty snake, really nice side swipe. Um, you know, a lot of, a lot of great things. There you go. You're going to fall. So really cool clutch. I don't know if I'm missing any comments here. Hey, my boy, man, I miss you so much. Yeah, I haven't been on here very much. What's up, Phil? Got to get out to you in one of these days, but we'll wait till it's a little bit warmer. <laughs> Plus, I would imagine a bunch of your snakes are probably down for the season right now. I don't know if you brumate or whatever to breed. Um, kid I work with keeps uh, some colubrids and a few other people. I'm always jealous that a lot of these people get to, uh, hey, Selena, what's up? A lot of these people get to put their snakes down for the season. They don't have to clean, feed, do all this, all this shit. But also, if that's all I kept, I don't know what I would do in my life. To not have that stuff going on and not be working with them every day would be weird. Okay, so we left off here. Now, we're getting out of order because I have part of the skunk clutch up here and part of the skunk clutch down here. So we're jumping into baby number eight on the skunk clutch. This clutch uh, has been very problematic with feeders. The ones that do well do fantastic, and the ones that do not just do not. I had like three from that clutch that would not eat, would not eat, would not eat, would not eat. I finally got them to eat. They regurged and died. So it's, um, and that, that happens a lot where you see babies that won't feed. A lot of times it is there's something wrong with the baby uh, that you can't see, something internal or digestive tract, whatever it is, organs, something is not right. And so a lot of times that's why the animal doesn't eat. And then once it finally does, it's usually at like the final stages of life where it's kind of just convinced itself I have to eat to survive. And usually that's enough stress on its system to just kind of finish the job, unfortunately. Um, but it's one of those things that you have no way of knowing um, until it happens, basically. You know, unless you have x-rays and you're some kind of doctor or something fancy, which I'm not. Um, sorry, bud. So this is the skunk stuff. Really, really cool animals. Uh, this is baby number eight. She's a female. She's a busy body. Um, you know, these are the ones that have that real inky black sides there, uh, which was really cool. This is where we, uh, this, this is a side swipe animal, but this is where we did uh, side swipe to skunk line. And ultimately, like, this is what I wanted to make with this, but I thought it was going to take many generations to get to this level where I had this solid black on the side and I didn't even know that was possible. So a lot of the times you get some black splotching and things on the skunk line animals. Uh, I didn't expect it to basically fill in where the side swipe takes over and wipes out the pattern and just puts all that black there. Uh, so that was a really, really, really cool thing to see. Um, and I'm definitely keeping this animal. Um, she's not, she's not available at all, but I just, I love, some of the saturation here and she's actually pretty dull right now. So I have a feeling she's headed in towards a second shed cycle. Um, I don't think she's quite in shed yet, but I think she's starting to dull out and head that direction, but you can still see the contrast and the color that she has is just really fantastic. Waterfall. It's so hard to pay attention on screen, make sure everything's centered and work with the animals. Uh, the next one, is from the same clutch, skunk clutch number nine. And uh, this animal is currently listed for sale. Um, also looks dirty. Uh, doesn't even look dirty, looks like she's dumped her water. Um, she's really cool and it's funny, when she came out, I thought, no fucking way. Um, oops, I just saw your comment, I thought you're a bit closer to me now, huh? Yeah, you could definitely come over sometime. We'll have to uh, work that out. Can't get enough of that skunk clutch. Yeah, me either. I really like it. Oh, you look like you're in a mood. That'd be a first. You want to not sell yourself? Is that it? No, you're just sitting funny. All right, so this is the girl that's available right now. I have her up on Morph Market. I have her, uh, I put her up on, on one of the Facebook groups. Um, honestly, she's probably a nicer animal than the last one. Uh, she's a little bit bigger. Um, she probably has cleaner 
the cleaner black there that just there's just a splotchiness about the other one that I just liked. And like I said, this one I thought was the one I was never, ever going to part with. And I still kind of hoping that she doesn't sell because um, I don't feel like I can have too many of these. They're so cool. I mean, look at that. You can't you can't beat that. Yeah. I mean, that's contrast that like you you dream about when you think about contrast, you know, white to black to that creamish color. And of course, you get all the people at Borneo's with the brown snakes. Like, no, they're really not. Um, some of them are, but. But by and large, there's so much more going on there. And I and and she has a little bit of a broken dorsal, but I think it kind of adds to the flavor there where you get some of that black coming in up top. Um, I'm trying to get them to pose is so hard, but I mean, look at that black just going down the side. It literally looks like somebody took a, a thick, fat, like Sharpie and just went shoop, down the side of the animal. And uh, you can't beat that. So if you want an animal that you're not going to find anywhere else, um, and I don't say that to be arrogant or anything, because I mean, I just, I just stick snakes together and they make cool stuff, but there is not an animal like this on the market anywhere. Um, and there's only a couple of people that even have the animals within their collection right now to make something like this, potentially. So this was Sideswipe to Skunk, but Charlie Murphy's a really dark Sideswipe, so I don't know how much that came into play with that black really being defining. Is it because of the skunk itself, or is it because of the skunk and Charlie being so dark? So what I want to do is run the other skunk girl to, <coughs> excuse me, to maybe Orion or Atlas or another of my Sideswipe males that's not as... Uh, defined and dark and see uh, what comes out if we get the same result if we get a different result so the cool thing about this whole project is it's, it's ground floor like I don't know where you can go from here I have no clue uh, it could be really cool in a couple of generations you have no idea even if everything you got looked like this why would that be a bad thing so if you're thinking about making a splash on a Borneo project honestly this is a, an awesome animal she's super chill doesn't care you know, I can do whatever. She's not bothered by it. Eats fantastic. Slams frozen thawed anything. I think I've given her mice, rats, and quail at this point. Um, never, never a problem. I thought you were dirty, but you're not even dirty. You just have a little water on your paper. And we're not going to worry about that. Because water ain't going to bother you. So definitely uh, you can reach out if you're interested in getting in on that project. She is not cheap. Um, I have her up for 1400 shipped. But I think for a one-of-a-kind animal that's going to put you in a position to make stuff uh, that most other people can't make, uh, it's a splash in the bucket, you know. You, you get a clutch of 14, 15 babies out of her, and they're that nice, uh, you will do quite well. What's going on, Brett? Uh, this girl looks like she's going into shed, so we'll try to get her out quick. Because she's a little um, high-strung sometimes, and I think if she's in shed... It's not going to make that any better. Um, not high strung in the sense that she bites or anything, but she can just get floppy. So this is from the skunk as well, and she's definitely going into shed because you can see how muted the black is right now. Um, but this one was really funky looking because, she, especially when she first hatched, she's darkened up a little bit, but she was like white on white on black. Uh, but she doesn't have your like traditional breakup of like dorsal to sides. She's just really kind of unique in that regard where it just kind of spills over. Um, so she's really, really cool. Definitely looking forward to doing some stuff with her in the future uh, and seeing where we can go with an animal like her, um, especially starting to maybe mix in with some other pattern mutation stuff and see where we can go. Um, you know, it's just very, very exciting. She eats great. She's a tease feeder, though. You've got to beat her up with the feeder a little bit, and then she eats. Um, she's not just a grab-off, tongs-and-go kind of girl. All right, this one, I had two like this, and the other one had digestive issues and just couldn't seem to get established. This one seems to be a little bit better um, and is another kind of just unique-looking animal. So... They're all getting muted. I think they're all headed into shed. But um, you can see similar to the other girls, but there's just a, a difference in the cleanliness up here and how the kind of a thinner dorsal stripe than the others 
there's just a slightly different appearance to this one. And I can't remember if this one's a female or a male. I'm hoping it's the male. I'm hoping the one I lost was the female just because this clutch was so female heavy and I want to be able to kind of do some different things. And, and obviously having some males and females gives you more opportunity to do that. Um, but just another A plus animal in my opinion. Um, you got a dookie coming? Don't poop on me. No pooping on YouTube. It's probably against their terms of service. Thanks, Matt. Um, but yeah, no, she, uh, she or he, I, I can't remember. I got to check. It's baby 13. I just don't remember off the top of my head. And my app in my phone tells me who's who. But, um, oh, did that upset you? Are you going to be okay? <laughs> this clutch has never, like, never struck. Um, they are, like, so far removed from being defensive that, like, when the ones were struggling to eat, you couldn't even really like piss them off into eating, which you can often do with bloods and short tails is just kind of tease feed them. And then eventually they get so pissed off that you would dare bother them that they'll bite, constrict. And then once they constrict, they'll usually eat it. Um, you know, 99% of the time, it just kind of triggers that instinct to do that. Um, so that's a good little trick when you have some stuff that's not really feeding. And that's where you kind of have to know the animals too, though, because sometimes they're not eating because they feel a lack of security. Sometimes they're not eating um, because they're timid with you around, whatever it is. And if you have an animal that's like super timid and nervous and then you're beating it up, uh, that's really not going to help. Uh, usually helps with the animals that are a little more defensive or a little more prone to being high, strung and irritable. Um, but these guys, uh, the tease feeding seems, seems to work pretty well with. And then there's one more skunk down here. Who's another one I'm definitely keeping. This is another female. You also actually went to the bathroom. Come here. Come here. And she's another one that's a little bit unique from the others. So another side swipe here, but you can see instead of the other ones where it's just totally clean, she's real jagged and rigid and kind of all over the place with hers. A little bit more of a lower expression side swipe. Uh, still very, very cool. And I love the way that the black melts in to like the other colors. So you get a more traditional kind of skunk pattern. So I, I like the fact that you're kind of seeing a max uh, ma mashup, I guess would be the word I'm looking for here, of the two genetics together on one animal, um, where you know the side swipe didn't completely dominate the pattern. Uh, the skunk still got a little bit of it in there. And uh, so I think that's cool. You see how it kind of flames into there. And she's got really cool eyes, which I can never get her to sit still long enough to see plus the camera trying to focus on too many things. But uh, she's a really cool baby, really enjoy her. Do you have a limit on babies you will keep or you just keep what you like? I mean, eventually I'll run out of room or resources, so I guess there's a limit somewhere. Um, I definitely went into this season planning on keeping maybe like a dozen babies back. And uh, yeah, the jaggedness is really awesome. I really like it, she's very unique. Um, and she's super chill, like she's just a lot of fun. She's very personable. She's always curious and everything that's going around. She's fun to take outside. Obviously it's winter here, so I can't now, but she loves being outside. She's super confident for a little baby. She will check everything out. Um, <laughs> what? Oh, talking about you being confident, now you're gonna pull back, make me look wrong. But, um, but yeah, so I went in thinking I'll keep like 10 or 12 babies and then stuff like this hatch that I didn't expect. Like I said, I figured, Animals like this, we're going to take two or three generations to kind of get that black to really come out like that in the way that it's contrasted. Um, so I, I didn't expect this. And therefore, you know, this clutch was something I was going to keep maybe three babies from. And now I'm keeping the bulk of it. Although this, this clutch was 14 babies. And I think I've lost at least five now uh, from this clutch. Like I said, there was a lot of problem feeders. Baby one, baby seven, baby two, baby four are all gone for sure. And then baby 12. So yeah, five of them uh, I've lost. But, um, you know, the ones that are here are solid. I don't, I don't foresee any other issues with the rest of them. 
There's one other one that's a little small, we'll see in a bit. Um, and he eats pretty good, he's just not grown like the other ones. Uh, these babies down here are something that's really, really cool. These I did not produce. Uh, these Rich Crowley produced, these are the Sarawak babies. Um, let me see here, I'm like a really bad spot for me to get you out of here. Come here. Come here. This is, this is I think, uh, I don't know, I think this is your YouTube debut, I don't know. Um, so this is one of the Sarawaks. This is uh, the male. Uh, and so these are a locality Borneo short tail. So no morph here. Uh, these are just uh, an isolated population that are quite different from the other Borneo short tail pythons. Um, if you watch the video, God, I want to say it was around episode 50-ish maybe. Um, that was at Rich's house. Uh, we, we looked at some of his Sarawaks there. Uh, they're just a very different texture, which is probably the biggest difference. And they're uh, a little um, a little less receptive to heat already than short tails are. So short tails don't like being too hot. These are even more um, like bothered by the heat. And I, I guess if you heat them up too much, these guys can, can perish from being too warm, which other short tails will as well. Uh, don't think that they won't. These ones just uh, don't have the upper tolerance that the other short tails have. So that's why these ones are on the very bottom of the rack in the room in here, as cool as they can be. They're not on any heat but the room heat. Um, and so far they've done really, really great for me. Um, and I hope that continues because I really like them. And I'm looking forward to hopefully pairing them up eventually and being able to hatch some Sarawak stuff of my own. Um, something that I've watched, you know, and for those of you that look at them and think, meh, understand that I was with you for a long time until I got my hands on them in person and felt that texture difference and saw how the scalation is, which you really just can't quite see in pictures or videos completely. Um, it's just, it's just a totally different animal. It's a different feel. And, uh, so I just, I just really like it. And, um, Excited to have them. Very thankful I was able to, to work out a deal with Rich to get them. Um, they've been they've been really, really cool. And obviously they're they're well past quarantine now. I got those animals back in October. We're in into uh middle of January here, so don't want anybody to get freaked out that they're in here. They've uh they've passed all their, their necessary criteria. What is the winter temperature in your snake room? I don't adjust my temperature for winter or summer, I leave my temperature alone. Uh, it'll naturally fluctuate a little bit in here just because of, um, you know, the way the house is insulated, the way the weather outside affects the house. I shut the heat off in here right now to do this video so it doesn't kick on and off. Um, but generally speaking, this room will range anywhere from 77, 78 up to, excuse me, 82 or 83. Sometimes in the peak of summer, um, I struggle to keep it cool enough and it'll push up towards the mid 80s. So that's something I have to be real conscious of this year because that's getting into the no good zone for those guys. Um, so I'll have to figure that out. It may even mean that I have to take their tubs out, you know, when we get to those periods and, and put them in a different room, um, you know, and just do some standalone tubs for a week or two during the summer when we hit those peak temperatures. Uh, that's actually how I ended up losing my Thai bamboo rat was during the summer. It just, it just got too hot in here. And I tried to, I tried to keep him, uh, as cool as I could. And unfortunately it just hit the mid eighties and, and that's really enough for them when they can't retreat away from that temperature and they're not the brightest snakes. So most snakes would like go into their water and cool down and, and, and he just didn't do that. Uh, so now we'll move into the other rack here. This baby was actually the first baby that hatched this season. Um, she is from the Electra Clutch. One thing that I have not talked to you guys about recently, uh, right before I just went on my little Christmas trip, I lost Electra. Uh, she had been doing fantastic since we went through all the, the BS uh, this, this past year. Uh, she was eating great. She had kicked the respiratory infection that she had, which was really secondary to all the other stuff she had going on. Um, she went through a course of antibiotics just to be on the cautious side because she did have some, she had an egg that was stuck in there and rotten inside. 
So we did the antibiotics partially because of the respiratory, although to be honest, I don't think the antibiotics is really what cleared up the respiratory. I think it was just getting all that stress off of her and getting her back into a normal routine. Um, but I think she started cycling this year and I wonder if there was something wrong in her that when she started cycling kind of just triggered her um, because she went from fine to just belly up, um, you know, basically overnight. I'd say 48 hours before I, I found her passed away. She was getting a little racy around in, in, in her, her enclosure and not anything to raise my concerns because a lot of times when the females are, are really cycling hard, they'll get a little restless. Um, and that was the, the behavior she has exhibited in the past in years where she was looking to breed. Um, so I didn't really think anything of it beyond, beyond that. Uh, but obviously, once I found her, she had passed away, then I thought maybe there was something else going on that triggered that. So I got two babies from her um, that that survived. One of them I sold to Keith, and this is the other one. So the Sideswipe one went to Keith. This one's just really unique. So um, she's got a lot of, like, ultra look, but not traditional like it's it's really funky and it's hard to pick up and she can get a little swimmy so it's hard for me to show you what I want to show you without her getting swimmy but her tail area especially is like really funky and I love her sides so she's not side swipe or anything but she's got you know so much going on with the pattern in her sides and the color is not really showing up but it's like this orangey caramel color um oops go to the bathroom Go in the bucket. That's perfect. That's what that bucket's for, all the nasty water. Keep going. Bear with me. She's going to the bathroom. I don't know if she's done or not. We'll have to see because I'm pretty sure she's got a poo brewing in there too. You can still see she's pretty heavy down there. So she might push out a little more yet. Um, but uh, I th think she's done for the moment. She's still got her vent open a little bit. She might push stuff out yet. I'm just going to put her back so she can do what she wants to do. If she wants to go to the bathroom. Um, she was like horribly swimmy as a baby. Like, trying to get pictures of her, forget it. Um, she just would not sit still. I like had to make custom containers to try to do pictures of her. Uh, my ass is probably hanging out. Sorry about that. Welcome to being a man and getting older, our ass disappears, it abandons us like everything else. But, um, yeah, so I uh, was a real pain in the ass getting pictures of her, but I'm really excited to see how she develops. And obviously, sentimental reasons, I'm happy to have her. I mean, I have a lot of Electra babies in here, you know, Callisto, all those little babies are her grandbabies, um, at, you know, Astra, Orion. So it's, it's not like I don't have animals from her, but, um, you know, she was an animal I expected to be here for. Thank you. I appreciate that. She was an animal I expected to be here for a long time to come. Um, I can't remember how old she was. I want to say she's around a 2012 animal. So she was only 10. I mean, she's really at the, the peak of her life. Um, but unfortunately, sometimes these things happen, especially not knowing what went on internally. And, uh, you know, we went to the vet several times with her. And I, the last time I went to the vet, the vet told me, like, I was being paranoid, not, that there was no reason to come in. And I'm like, I'm telling you, there's still something in there. And he's like, no, no, no. We got everything out that showed in the x-ray. Everything's out. Everything's out. I'm like, dude, I'm telling you, I can feel it. And, of course, I, I took her back. And he's like, if you really want to bring her, you can bring her. But you're wasting your money or whatever. And, of course, there was a, another egg lodged in there. And that was the rotten one. And he was able to get that out. And that's why we did the antibiotics and whatever. And I'm not crazy about doing antibiotics unless they're necessary, but with something like that, you know, you're in, you're in a gray area where you're risking to not do it. You're, you're risking less, I think, to do it. So we did do a course of it with her. And it wasn't anything real heavy and harsh. It wasn't Batril or anything like that. But even, even Fortaz, you know, can take its effect on stuff. But I, I think something was wrong with her reproductive tract from whatever happened and I have a feeling that her going back into cycling just through that. And I didn't, I didn't cycle her on purpose. 
Um, I don't, I don't honestly cycle any of these guys. It just naturally happens. I watch their behavior and pair them up when I see them doing things, if it's a year that they're going to be bred. She wasn't going to be bred, so it wasn't even a thought on my mind. Um, she was on a normal schedule, eating, doing, doing normal things. This guy I saw earlier is going into shed. He's also dirty though, so we'll clean him. But he's real, real dull. This guy is up on Morph Market right now available. Um, we're getting into the blood python clutch now from the big T positive girl. Uh, this is one of the T positive 007 males. Uh, like I said, he's in shed right now, so you're not seeing uh, a real representation of what he looks like. Um, he's real, real dull and muted. You can kind of see if he sits still long enough and you look in his eyes, you can see he's, he's in shed. Um, cool pattern on him. Super chill snake. Uh, really easy to work with. Doesn't give me any problems. Eats fantastic. Obviously, you can see how big he is. Um, great eater. Great temperament. Super cool dude. Um, you know, I can't say enough good things about him. Uh, but for whatever reason, he has not been selected yet as uh, somebody's nice new breeding project or even a pet. If you wanted a, a cool pet, he would uh, he would do you just fine. He's totally chill. Never looked at me the wrong way since he was a baby. You guys remember when the, this clutch hatched, they were a little high strung for the first like three weeks. Um, now all of them are cool except for the one female is a raging bitch. You know, what are you going to do? You can see I have I have the snake sitting right here on the cart. Um, you know, and I'm reaching around doing whatever. He doesn't doesn't give it a shit. Um, so if that doesn't tell you, he's got a chill temperament when you're swirling around above his head. Um, as you saw, I put a bunch of them on the cart while I'm cleaning here. And, uh, you know, these guys have been really, really great. And that's another thing. Uh, that I, I got into some discussions with people and whatnot. You know, temperament is really something that you can breed for. And I think people don't always look at it the right way. Even people that do try to do it aren't really looking at it properly. They're looking at the temperament of the adult animal, um, which obviously matters, but you know, there's the whole nature versus nurture thing where you can take an animal that's defensive and you can get that animal to a point where you can work with it and not see that behavior anymore. But that inherent personality type is still there. Uh, so if you're breeding that animal, that doesn't mean that that animal um, is, is passing along a super sweet temperament. And, it, and it's not you know, it's not two super sweet animals are always going to produce super sweet animals and two asshole animals are always going to produce asshole animals. Um, like anything else that's genetic, there's there's anomalies, there's there's dominant recessive, there's things going on, there's different combinations of genetics that work together different ways. But um, typically how the babies kind of start off, once they settle and get used to you, that temperament is usually what you're you're actually passing on. And so those babies that naturally just really adjust really well, handle everything, handle all that stress, um, you know, don't seem to be bothered by anything. Those are, those are the babies that grow up into adults that you can work into a project and really, really keep pushing it. So don't forget, if you guys are looking for a really, really nice T-positive 007 to check this guy out, um, the next snake we're going to look at is another male T-positive 007, and they're both up on the same ad. Um, I just made it easy and just kind of put your choice, whichever one you want, um, for the same price. And also, if you guys are looking for a pair, I do have the one female T-positive 007 left. Keep in mind, she is, a, she is an absolute bitch, um, but she is, is also available. And uh, I would do a really, really good deal on a pair. Hi, bud. What's going on? So this guy, same thing, but he just, he he's not going into shed right now, but he's probably not far behind. What kind of twisted tea we got there? It is the raspberry flavor. Is it safe pouring water after the chlorhexidine? Yeah, I mean, I have to assume so. I've been doing it for years. So I wipe it out and, and do whatever. Um, so this is, the, uh, this is the other male. I'd call him like a little more dirty patterned, whereas the other male's a little bit cleaner. The cleanest one just sold, so he just shipped out to Florida uh, earlier this week, uh, along with that T-positive female that really was really hard for me to let go. 
I had like four or five people that wanted to buy her that I said no because they were going to either be on payment plans or they were going to have to wait to ship because of weather where they were. And I was just like, if I see that snake go through another shed, I'm not letting her leave. So I needed her to get out of here now or stay forever. And so she went with the, uh, the other male. But this guy, I really like the big, big, wide, like swooping circles he's got on his side and how busy it is. Um, and then, like I said, his back has really got a lot of pattern. And once this starts to go a little more red, it's going to be awesome. You can see once again, I mean, super chill, not, doesn't care. Super great if you wanted a pet, super great if you want a breeder because there's a lot of red behind these. And that's the thing when you get into snakes like this, like these T-positive 007s, T-positive ivories, ivories, you know, even 007s. You can hide the quality of these pretty well because your the red isn't as apparent as it is in your your normal blood pythons. So, you know, you get an ivory, it could look really pretty, but it could be from a couple of brown hideous snakes. The lineage on this animal between selective origins and TBC uh, goes back to generations of super red stuff. Um, and especially on the TBC side, and I only say that not to knock the selective origin side at all, but I just um, don't have a lot of the generations back on that size, whereas I have, you know, great grandparents and great great grandparents on this side that I've seen. So I know those animals are, are stupid, stupid red uh, going back several generations. And obviously, the big T positive female is gorgeous. Um, the male, very handsome fella. Um, so just a plus lineage in here and the parents on dad's side that I did see from Matt are screamers. Uh, I just didn't see back whatever, but I think anybody that knows what Matt works with knows that everything that he has is high quality. So I can't say that I've seen that far back, but I have never seen Matt with an animal that I would consider ugly ever. Um, so just a plus lineage can't be beat. You know, you're going to you're gonna do great things with an animal like this, and he's a pleasure to work with. So that's that's the biggest thing. Like, it's really cool having beautiful animals, but when they suck to work with, it takes a lot of the fun out of it. Uh, Hera, Hera is doing well. She's in shed right now. I actually just changed her chip uh, like two days ago. Um, she's doing, doing fantastic. Um, she settled back in really, really well coming back home. Uh, she, you know, I was worried given how those animals are and how they kind of build a relationship with you. And then I'm out of the picture for over a year. And she let me know when I went and picked her up that she was displeased with the fact that I left her. But I also saw instantly the recognition. I'm sorry, but I just slapped you right in the face. Um, where she came out of the cage there looking to like mess me up and you saw her stop and pick up my scent. And you saw the wheels turn and her realize that she knew who I was and she she dropped it and went back into her more traditional self. Um, I just I just changed her chip the other day. I didn't even use a hook on her, nothing, just reach right in. She came right out as soon as I opened the door, just grabbed her, moved her, put her in a bucket, changed out the chip, scrubbed out her cage, vacuumed it all out, did all that jazz, put the new chip back in, right out of the bucket, picked her up, put her back. So she's been great. Um, she doesn't give me any issues at all. Uh, like I said, she's in shed right now, so uh, I haven't been messing with her very much, but she should uh, she should be out of shed probably in three or four days, given where she is in her cycle. So, don't sleep on this dude. Look at him. He's just sitting here sad. He's homeless. Nobody loves him. You have a great opportunity. Hey, how quickly it's shed. Yeah, rock pythons are one of those things where uh, you say it's harder to sell blood pythons given their reputation. Honestly, I don't think so. Um, the hardest sell is Borneos because people don't understand the genetics because they're not A, B, C. This is how it works. There's more polygenic stuff going on. There's more things that are coming through line bred, uh, whereas something like this is, is cut and dry. You know, uh, every baby you make from this animal is going to be hat for albino. Uh, if it's golden eye, it's golden eye. If it's matrix, it's matrix. If it's 007, it's 007. There's no like iffy. The only iffy thing with this is sometimes matrix can be hard to tell in the T positive animals because you can't use the easy way and just go by tongue color. You got to look at eye stripe. You got to look at different things. What are you looking at? 
Let me look at it. Look at my glasses. Um, I still have the white lip. Yep, he's actually pretty sure uh, he he probably just shed about four or five days ago now. Um, but yeah, he's in the he's in the far room. Him and my my adult female Olive Python are in that room. Uh, not together in the same cage, but they're just both in big six foot cages. So that those two cages basically have their own room with some storage stuff in there. Um, but he's doing fine. He's still still a jerk in his cage. Still pretty good out. Uh, I'm getting way off my train of thought here. I keep reading all these messages and then losing where I was going. And we're spending a lot of time on this snake. Um, oh, so the reputations as far as selling. I don't really find the reputation is that difficult, to be honest. Um, I mean, you do get the people that expect them to be a certain way, but I think not for anything. Anybody that's interested enough to actually buy a blood python knows that that's a bunch of BS. Um, there's very few people that are interested in buying them that don't know that at this point. You're in so I'm going to leave you be. You're not in shed. Nice. This is one of the T-positive boys. The other one I just have is a T-positive male as well, uh, but just in shed. Um, so this guy is available. I don't have him listed anywhere right now. Uh, this is baby number three, five. I don't know. Could be seven, could be eight. No, eight was a, eight Rich Crowley has. That was a T-positive 007. Nine is that this one's got to be, it's got to be seven. It's got to be number seven. But anyways, uh, he's male. I know this because all the T positives I have left are males. All the females are gone. Um, super chill, obviously. You can see. Let's see. Ooh. But um, really nice guy here. Got a lot of potential to get a lot of color as he ages. I like his pattern quite a bit. I think he's got a lot of cool stuff going on there. Um, you know, obviously easy to handle. No issues there. Don't see any matrix in this one. Really thin eye stripe. Uh, pattern doesn't suggest matrix. So just a T positive. Uh, obviously, you know, you could be wrong. Could be a matrix. Um, but I always just sell them as T positive if I don't know for sure. And that's that. All right. Why don't you want this snake? Oops, I just punched him in the face. But even that he rolls with. Um, just super, super nice. Obviously not not really head shy. You can see the increased tongue flicks, you know, figuring out why the hell is this guy rubbing my chin, rubbing my face, but overall pretty good. And I, I think he's gonna have some nice purple come in on the sides of his neck there at some point as he ages. <laughs> they don't like to cooperate. It's funny, they'll sit and chill in my hands for 20 minutes and like the moment you try to put them in a pose, nope, they gotta fucking jet all over God's green earth and be a huge pain in the butt. Ugh. Let's put you back. Nope, nope. Next one is one of my holdbacks. This is a uh, the golden eye male. And this fucker has not had his first shed yet. He will not shed for me. I don't know why. Eats fine. Um, was a little bit of a slow starter. Needed to be tease fed. Now he's doing pretty good. Really kind of a cool golden eye. I can't wait to see what happens when this guy uh, goes through a couple shed cycles because you guys have seen my other golden eye from last year. Are you going to the spicy female? She's technically next, but I probably won't take her out. She doesn't like being touched. Um, if she's dirty and I have to clean her, I'll show you how I usually move her. Uh, so she she kind of gets to move on her own and we're slowly getting there with some trust um, She'll still wail the shit out of me, but uh, you know, this guy was actually a bit of a handful when he was a baby He was a real real bag of shit for a little bit longer than most of the others and now now he's fine um, But she's coming around where I've been able to get my hands on her a little bit a couple times and not uh not had any real, real major issues. So yeah, he's calmed down a lot, but I'm really excited to see when he actually sheds, you know, that's gonna be, that's gonna be a pretty cool looking golden eye there. Real, real busy pattern. 
I know, but I'm trying to show off all your best features here. So when that starts turning red on that white, I think it's going to look really cool and this starts to yellow out more. Um, and just to show you, so keep this, uh, keep this look in mind and um, I'll show you real quick. We'll jump into this other rack here. Um, I do have two snakes in my collection that happen to be with the baby, so we can we can take them out. This is the golden eye female from the previous season. Um, yeah, piece of shit underneath. Um, so she has already started. She's already gone through a few shed cycles, and you can see how much more red she is already. And I mean, she's only a year and change old at this point, so she's still got a long way to go. But I think by looking at her after him, you can see the potential of where that one's going to go. Um, and hopefully I'll be able to pair these two together someday. They are half siblings. Um, but I, I definitely would like to see what I can do with all the red that's in, in this lion. It's really hard to get the purple to show up, but she's got a ton of purple. Yeah, you really can't you really can't see it at all. That's crazy. <laughs> but basically like all down here is all purple and all ridged up through here. Um she's got a bunch around her head and stuff. It kind of just you can see it's surrounding the red there, but it doesn't really look purple on the screen. Uh but it is in person. But she's such a great animal. I adore her. And I can't wait to uh to see her in her adult colors because I think she's just going to be absolutely saturated red and, and just fantastic. If she didn't change from this, I would be happy. Uh, but she's only she's only a year and change old. She's got another year, year and a half, two years maybe of color change. So obviously, you know, some dra it, it's, it's weird because some babies change drastically first couple of sheds. Her second shed was the shed where you really went like, Wow. The first one you saw a little bit like, oh man, she's, she's getting some color change. But the second shed was mind blown. And then the third shed was pretty cool. And this past shed, she just shed a few days ago. Um, she shed probably like Sunday or Monday. Um, and uh, this last shed was not a huge change. So it's slowing back down. And then others, the first seven or eight sheds is little increments. And then all of a sudden they'll have one where they really explode with color later on. So it's interesting to see. And uh, Miss Cranky Pants is not dirty. So unless she decides to come out, which I highly doubt she will, I'm going to leave her in here. Let me see. I can at least. Don't you dare bite me. Don't you dare bite me. You guys can at least check her out here. She's pretty. Um, she's just, I mean, you can see just by her pose, just the way she's sitting. She's just always alert, always defensive. Um, and don't get, me, don't get me wrong, I can reach in there, I can pick her up. She's gonna bite me, but what does that solve? Nothing, it doesn't teach her anything. It's not teaching her to trust me. And so basically I, um, I just want her to learn that I'm not going to grab her, hurt her, do anything detrimental to her. Um, and so we're, we're getting there. Oh, this one is deep, deep, deep into the shed. This is number 12. Just show him off real quick because he is like deep, deep, deep in shed. Um, and I think this is this one's first shed. This one was a real slow starter. Um, and still, like every time you feed that one, you've got to got to really, really tease feed it. Um, and he's the only one of the bloods you really got to tease feed. Um, he'll eat every time, but you've got to you've got to make him want it. Whereas the other ones are just like you know you can't reach your hand in there when they know there's food. This is a kind of an interesting pattern one. I've noticed a few people that do golden eye stuff. You get these snakes that like almost, almost, almost are on the edge of like golden eye look uh, without actually being golden eye. And they get a lot of the same, 
you know, pattern type stuff. I mean, this animal looks very similar to the golden eye that I held back. Just small, subtle differences, a little bit more heavier pattern when you look at it from here. But as far as the sides go, they're not that far off. But I mean, you know, obviously it's not a golden eye. But it's interesting because I've seen some snakes like that Zach has done through his golden eye pairings that are very, very similar to golden eye. So I think there's more going on genetically um, than, not necessarily that we, we understand, but that even though this animal didn't get the golden eye gene, uh, it, there's still some kind of effect from whatever maybe was riding with the original animals that that golden eye came from that's enough to pass on in some sense and kind of manipulate the pattern. Do you breed any other snakes camera search? <laughs> Got a little autocorrect there. Um, I'm assuming you were gonna ask any other species besides bloods and short tails. Um, I have in the past, right now, I, I haven't paired anything up this year at all and I'm not even sure I will. I'm debating maybe pairing up Voodoo Queen, maybe this other skunk girl and maybe Raiden or you know one of the bloods or something. But definitely not pairing up stuff like I uh, paired up last year. Mostly because, you know, you're getting these people going back and forth. Some people say the market hasn't changed. Some people say it has. What I can tell you personally is I am not selling snakes as well this year as I have traditionally. Um, it's been a lot tougher. I have normally this time of year, I don't have any babies left from the previous season. I have, you know, two racks full of babies right now. So... I also produced more this year than I have in the past couple of years, but I definitely feel like stuff is, is moving considerably slower. And so with my baby racks being primarily full right now, where would I put babies if I hatch them? Uh, so, you know, unless some stuff starts moving or I just want to focus on one or two pairings or something, I, I may just not do anything. I haven't decided yet. It's getting late. Um, I haven't missed the window yet. Um, maybe with a couple of girls, but, um, a lot of my girls traditionally don't ovulate until at least mid February, um, if not later. So I'm not too, too concerned, but this is a really cool looking animal that I can't believe nobody's bought yet. Um, and when he has his next shed, he's going to really, really pick up some color. Um, the female that I just sold was similar to him other than a little bit redder at this stage, but I think he's gonna catch up to her uh, probably in a couple of sheds. I think she'll always be a little bit more red than him, but he's got kind of a, almost like a camouflage looking pattern. I just think it's really cool. Um, you know, and if you're gonna have a snake as a pet, why not have something cool looking and that's chill? You know, I mean, you see, same as the other ones, totally cool, do whatever I want. He doesn't care, you know, not biting. I don't think I can sneak him into my luggage. What do you think? But super cool guy. But yeah, I'm very surprised some of the animals that have remained. Like I remember last year, the um, the T-positive 007 females. Everybody was complaining. I had a bunch of males. Everybody was like, I want a female. I want a female. I want a female. Also, guys, don't forget to hit the like button if you're here. I haven't reminded anybody this entire video. And so our likes are pretty low. Uh, compared to most of our live streams because I've forgotten to mention it. Usually I have to pound that into you guys. Thank you, whoever just did that. Um, but anyhow, everybody wanted females. This year I had females and they didn't move as much. Um, sold one to a guy down in New Jersey. Um, I'm trying to think where else females went. I have a holdback female. Brian has one. Uh, most of you guys that are on here regularly know Brian. Uh, he has the female that was actually going to be one of my holdbacks that I let go of. Um... I was going to say, I'm like, where the hell is your tub? I have it down here. Actually, this guy looks like he's going into shed when I look at his belly. It's uh, it's getting pretty muted, so he's he's headed that direction. There. Um, next, we are, well, actually, I'll pop over there after. There's one more blood from that clutch, one of my holdbacks, but she's already in the other rack. We'll check her out at the end. This is one of the Sumatrans. Um... This one's not as big of a fuck bag as the other one. Um, so this is one of the Sumatrans from the Midnight Rider to Morticia clutch. Um, they, they, this clutch has been different from every other clutch of Sumatrans that I've ever done. 
They're a little edgier, um, a little more apt to be impatient. And uh, they also like, some of them are really strong feeders, but some of them like, I actually have to sit there and, and, and jiggle it a little bit for, which usually Sumatrans are not that way. Uh, yeah, if you keep these guys like you keep ball pythons, you're either going to eventually kill them or you're going to have absolute chainsaws. Uh, heat that hot will drive these guys nuts. So ball pythons, you can run a hot spot, you know, 86 to 90 uh, and, and be pretty, pretty good. Uh, these guys, uh, you get them that hot, especially if they can't get away from it. They just bite and bite and bite and stress and will stress themselves to death. Um, these guys do best in about 78 to 82 degrees. If you are going to run a hot spot, I would say, unless you're talking about an adult that has a lot of room to get away uh, from the hot spot, I would not go over 84 or 85. Um, with adults that really have the ability to thermoregulate and are confident and don't need to hide all the time and whatever, uh, you can probably run a little bit warmer hot spot with them. Um, and just kind of trial by fire, but you really don't need to. There's no reason that you need to get them that hot unless they're breeding uh, for gravid females. You give them a little bit of a hot spot, but even that, you don't have to go that warm. Um, but usually if you do give them a, a, a decent hot spot when they're gravid, they'll utilize it. So that's one of the Sumatrans there. The next Sumatran in this rack is one that can be a pain in the ass. It's definitely one of the more uh, bitchy Sumatrans from this clutch. It doesn't necessarily try to bite, but it will like get floppy and just be a pain in the ass. Um, today, of course, it won't because I'm talking about that. Plus, I also, it looks like it's dulling out and going into shed. This one's got a little bit more brown. This is probably one that I'll let go of um, once I get around to selling these guys. But I don't even think this one's that brown normally. I think it's uh, headed into a shed. There's like four of the Sumatrans that are in shed now. She looks like a bitch. Yeah, that, that one T positive 007 is, is a massive asshole. Um, and she's been consistently, you know, she hasn't changed. She's gotten a little bit better. Uh, now I believe we're going to move back into skunk stuff. So, yep, yeah, this is uh, skunk baby number three. This is another one that I kicked around with selling instead of that other one that I have listed. But this one just had a little bit more strong traditional dorsal. And so that's kind of what made me keep this one over that one. Like I said, I kind of just like to keep them all. But uh, but she's got, she's got a really, really nice, clean side swiping. That white to black. You know, the light actually makes it look um, less black than it is just the way the light uh, the light is behind uh, where I have you guys set up. Can you sit still for a second so people can look at you? Come on. Um, but yeah, you can see just really cool animals, the skunk stuff. So it's funny, I almost sold the skunk females. I just never felt like I, I didn't have a skunk male. I'm like, I don't know what I'm gonna do with them. So I really grew them up slow. Those are 2015 animals, and last year was the first time that I bred the one female, and the one down here I've never bred uh, to date. Obviously, now that I see the potential and what Rob's been doing the last couple of years and then doing this, um, I think there's a lot of potential to work with with skunk within the stuff that I already have here, and maybe at some point I'll try to add some stuff. I'm going to have to get some babies from, from Rob or... Also, Josh Ortiz has some skunk stuff kicking around. Um, I'm going to have to get some stuff from them just to kind of keep the project going and try some skunk to skunk stuff, but that's outcrossed enough. But yeah, you can see now with the, if I can get it out of the light, you can see the black a little bit better when the light's not hammering on it. You know, I mean, that's more closer to true right there. But cool babies. Don't give me any problems. Look awesome. Uh, as I mentioned before, or if you missed it, the one skunk that is for sale, don't miss out. Uh, I can't say it's a one-of-a-kind animal because I have a few of them, but it is the only place you're going to find that animal uh, right now. Maybe in future years other people will produce something. Are you just hanging out in your water? Oops, shit. Would you like to come out? Come here. Come on. Come out. So this is the baby I told you about earlier that's just kind of a little bit smaller than the others. 
Um, but I, I think he's past the point where I'd worry. Two damage. What, let me see what you said there that you're saying Jesus to. Any tips on super stubborn stuck eye caps? I'm at my wit's end and scared to damage the eye. Sumatranides protrude out too much, scared to apply too much pressure with finger. Uh, that's a tough one. Especially if it's if it's multiple layers and it's really stuck on there. Um, I don't know what you've tried, but uh, if you can get like, um, you know, I don't know how big of a snake it is, but say a snake for this size, I would put in like a six quart tub, load it up with like saturated paper towels, and then put it on a low heat source. So not something, you know, I mean, even even like mid mid 70s monitor it make sure it doesn't get too hot for the animal but just enough to really create um some steam in there and whatever and let the animal sit in there for for like an hour or two and just continually monitor that temperature temp gun make sure the snake's not nervous okay big adult male you could put into like a 34 quart or um even a, a 41 or something that you can you can get it to stay in and do the same general idea uh that can often loosen it up and then you know you saw somebody say the q-tip you could try that um some people recommend tape. Tape can work, but it also can be very dangerous. Um, you know, anytime you're working with a live animal that has the ability to pull away, um, you have to be very careful what you do because it's not even just what you're doing. It's how the animal reacts to what you're doing that you have to worry about. Um, so obviously, if you have somebody there that's comfortable hands-on with the animals that can help, uh, that can make things easier. But anything on these animals' heads, even super calm ones, when you start restraining them and doing stuff, you really run the risk of them pulling away or moving, so you have to be careful. Um, at this point, though, if it's that bad, you've got to get it off of there because it's not going to get better on its own, and uh, you're going to run the risk of, of the snake losing vision in that eye eventually or having more complications, infections, things like that. Um, you know, you can, if you have a reptile vet that's good, sometimes they can help with stuff like that. Uh, but I would I would try doing that and see if you can loosen it up as much as possible and then try to work it off safely. Um, but this skunk this skunk guy I believe he's a male I have to double check. Um, if he is a male I'm probably going to keep him uh, just because I need some male skunk stuff. But he uh, he's like really really cool. I remember when he first hatched I was like you know the pattern on this guy really really awesome and. Uh, I really like this side that he doesn't want to show off as much. They always want to go the opposite way of like their best side. <laughs> I swear to God, you can't like convince them otherwise. Let's see if we can't. Well, always, always. They have their, their way they go. It's like a f bun bunch of fucking Derek Zoolanders. Um, can only turn one way. But yeah, I just I really like the way that that kind of oscillates. And as I talked about in one of the earlier babies where you get like the, the black flaring of the skunk, but also like the more traditional Borneo colors kind of coming through. Just think there's a lot of potential with an animal like that. Um, so I got to double check. Like I said, I think he's a male. If he's a male, he'll definitely stay. If it's a female, it's one of those things where I have so many other females I like, I would have to consider letting it go. This next one is sold. Uh, I don't think I saw Keith pop in today, but this is his boy. Um, it's just too cold out where he is to ship. So he paid half half down and, you know, when we can move him out, we'll, we'll take the rest. But this is a male from the skunk. Um, really, really cool pattern animal here. Got a lot of that black flaring through, and he's a big baby. Um, he's always been probably the biggest in the clutch, I think. Um, just a just a bulky bulky tank but once again you get that real nice example of where the black more classic skunk you know without the side swipe here like this is this is a skunk animal that just you know really has some of the cool qualities of of that line um, where you get those big swirls with all that black surrounding it so it's a nice example to see what skunk looks like without side swipe really getting in there and doing too much. Um, so this is a cool animal. Uh, Keith's got some other animals from me and uh, he's got some really cool stuff. So hopefully in a couple of years, he's gonna be doing some cool projects. We can see some really cool black and the contrast down there to like the, the creamy tail colors. 
I love Borneos with thick tail stripes. Um, it's just, I think they look so cool. Who doesn't like a good thick bottom? It's important. Uh, who do we have next? Ah, we're getting into the Lilith clutch. Atlas to Lilith. These babies are all a little bit more like swimmy. Um, so I may not be able to hold them up for long periods of time, depending on how they want to be. Um, but I think these babies are really cool. Another clutch that just was very problematic. Um, but the sides on him. So this, uh, you guys have seen Atlas, and Atlas has some grays to him. And I have the, the male that's his um, younger three-quarter brother um, that I always used to call my favorite Borneo that got gray. And then if you guys have ever seen Ryan Spellman's from that clutch that I sold him that went like crazy blues and grays, um, these guys are really developing that color early on. So I think these are going to get really wild gray and blue as they get older. And I love that white down there. It's hard to describe. It's like so white, it's almost transparent. Let me see if I can get this one to flip around. Like I said, these ones are a little bit more swimmy typically, but I think that's so cool looking. And I am really, really excited about these babies too. They're not mean or anything. They don't usually try to bite, but they just can really get floppy and get that really annoying Borneo short tail bullshit. Um, he's actually being really, really good. And I'm pretty sure this one's a male. He's definitely got a, a poo brewing for me too. Can feel it in there. And I don't think he's pooped in a while. Unfortunately, the lighting in here sucks. So you're not really getting the best look at these guys. Just kind of the way it is. Um, this one's really interesting and as I am almost certain is not going to really show up in a way. Uh, you get floppy already? Don't do it. It's, it's like super funky caramel colors. And I, I hatched one other baby out a long time ago. Um, like, I, I guess you can kind of see some of the color, but it's not quite showing true to how like milky caramel it is. Um, but I hatched one years ago that was kind of similar. And uh, I just thought really, really cool. And uh, let me have a bump. Check that out. I'm not eating live, so I don't think anything bit him. Um, but yeah, so I, I really think this is a cool, cool animal. It's got some really interesting colors. So I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing how it develops. Last year I hatched one that kind of had a sort of similar look, and it just like it just rolled on me. So I didn't really get to watch that one develop. Um, so I'm hoping this one will not do the same. The next baby I'm not going to take out because it hasn't fed yet at all. Um, and I just don't want to stress it out. I'm trying something a little different to see if I can get it feeding. Um, but I don't, I don't want to disturb it and handle it just for, for no reason um, while I'm trying to get that one situated. Hi, are you going to be a fuck bag? You look like you want to be a fuck bag. What's that about? Are you going to shed? I think so. Uh, another baby from the Lilith Clutch. This one's this one's like had some strange color changes already without even going through a shed cycle. Um, and it goes through like really, really gray blue to like right now it's kind of more of a muted version, uh, which could be that it's headed towards its first shed. Um, and so that could be why. But usually through, through here is like crazy like bluestone slate blue, I would call it. Uh, right now it's it's more of a a gray, not even quite silver. Um, but like I said, it could be heading towards its first shed because it hasn't shed yet. So that might be part of the reason. You can see it a little bit there, though. Real funky, nice colors. Trying to get it in the lighting where the light's not screwing it up. But just really interesting stuff in this clutch. And unfortunately, um, I've lost a lot of the babies from this clutch. Three of them. Uh, I had to put down in the beginning. They had averted hemipenes. Couldn't get them to go back in at all. They hatched like that. I tried everything uh, under the sun. The options would have been to have them surgically removed 
and whatever else, but I opted. I had I had them out at Dylan's, and he has indigos that are are snake feeders. So we opted to to go that route with them um, instead of doing that. So I'm mad at myself for waiting to pull the trigger on buying that mail. Congrats, cheat. Yeah, um, you know I can't. You missed out on that one. But yeah, Keith uh, Keith jumped on him. Keith's one of those people. If he hits me up about a snake at all. Um, I'm fairly confident it's going to him because he doesn't typically ask about anything and then decide not. I've suggested a couple things to him where he's kicked it around and then gone, yeah, whatever, but he's never asked me the details on an animal that hasn't ended up heading that way. I didn't even know that was a thing. Um, I'm assuming you're talking about the hemipenes. That's the first time that's ever happened to me in years of breeding. Um, I've seen it happen in older animals where, you know, a breed or something happens and one has to get amputated or something like that. I've never seen it happen in babies. Um, it does occasionally happen with Borneos. It's not unheard of. Um, I know Minotola has seen it a few times and, and whatever else. Like I said, it was just a really weird season of a lot of things going on this year that I, I don't typically and traditionally see. Um... So this one's been a little bit of a slow starter, but has picked it up. And uh, same clutch, totally different baby, much darker. And so this is one of those things that we see with Sideswipe. One of the Sideswipe animals also, just a reminder, if you haven't hit the like button yet, please do. Um, some of the, uh, one of the older, like matriarchs of the Sideswipe line was a very dark animal. And so from time to time, even in pairings that aren't necessarily from dark stuff, I get dark babies. Uh, and so this is one that's a little on the darker side. Not so much. I've, I've had much more extreme. And it seems to come out a lot more in stuff that goes to Lilith. Why, I don't know. Um, Lilith, unfortunately, is one of those animals I don't know the background on. And so... I really don't know what's what's going on in there, but she always seems to throw cool babies. So there must be must be something in there going on that uh, that's different. Is there a baby in here? Yeah. Hi. How we doing? Don't be a jerk. All right. And so this is. The last of the Lilith babies. Um, like I said, I've had a lot of problems. Can't tell if that's rain outside or one of the snakes in the ARS rack. I still can't tell if I'm standing right here. Um, I really like the color on this one. Hard to pick up once again. Trying to like get it in a light. But they've got like almost an ultra sort of look to them, but not quite completely. Um, I've actually begun to wonder um, if Lilith might not be some, some animal that came from maybe some bluish type stuff in the blue ghost line. I can't say for sure because I don't know the history, but just uh, looking at the way some of her babies change color, it's a lot more than I see in, in other stuff. You are so focused right now. A little freaked out. I just don't want it to swing around and try to get away and fall because it's it's kind of in that position. There we go. Sometimes moving can help. It was in that position where it was like in a real do I need to take off and get away mode there for a second. Yeah, it's got to be the rain because now it's coming from the other direction. It rains here like every day lately. But once again, like I showed you on that one earlier, sorry, I was trying not to touch it, but I can't see. It's got kind of that almost transparent white color down there. And if the light was behind it, and like I can, when I can look through and see through the snake, you'd be able to from the other direction, but the light obviously is not on that side. Um, but just really cool. And so I'm hoping to raise some of these up and, and see how they turn out. Didn't get a lot of like really, really clear, concise side swipe stuff out of this clutch which was kind of interesting. 
Um, and of course, this was Atlas back to Lilith, and Lilith is Atlas's mother. Uh, so we're really kind of doubling down on that line to see what's there. And I'm really not sure at this point. Um, but I just like them. So that is, that is the bulk of the babies um, from this season that I still have here now. Um, obviously, like I said, there's a few animals that are up on Morph Market. I don't have any of the T-positive males up there right now, but I have a selection. Oh, there's one over here, too. Forgot about Monster Baby. Monster Baby. And we didn't even look at the other Sumatrans. Huh. So Monster Baby's from the Blood Clutch. He's uh, baby number two. Uh, but he was just a big baby, so he's already in a much bigger tub. He just, he hatched huge, and he has not stopped growing, so he's, he's a big boy. Uh, I have somebody that's interested in him tentatively, but he's still up for sale. Um, you know, they're not sure if they're going to be able to swing it. But he, uh, he's funny because... He's like mock temperamental. And when I had, I took a few of these animals to Tinley with me uh, when I went out there. So they stayed with Dylan for like four days when I went out to Vegas. And he took, he took a couple swings at Dylan, uh, which he's never taken a swing at me. But um, took a couple swings at him. And then uh, I do notice from time to time, like when I'll put him back in his tub, he'll like posture like he's a tough guy. But honestly, he doesn't give me any trouble at all. You know, I haven't had any issues with him. He's fine. But it is funny to see him like puff out like, oh yeah, I could have totally taken you. It's like, listen, I know you're a big baby, but calm down. Um, but yeah, no, he did. He definitely didn't. Uh, he didn't like Mr. Hain and who can blame him? You know, Dylan. Pff. So I thought it was funny because I'm like, really? I'm like, he really tried to bite you? I'm like, this, this snake, you know, like I can piss him off, but no, no biting. So I don't know. But sometimes different people, different places, different levels of stress. You, you just don't know. Let's put him back. And yeah, like I said, I totally forgot about the Sumatrans. Yeah, he's doing it right now where he's like posturing like, hey, I'm super tough. Not impressed, dude. Sumatran, Sumatran, you're not in shed. I don't know what a lot of the lower ones are. Come on. Don't be a fuckbag. Oh, here's another Sumatran. This is baby number one from the Sumatran clutch. I haven't even picked holdbacks in this clutch yet. Um, trying to get them through a couple of sheds. My goal is to get the brown out of these guys. So a lot of the ones that have really obvious brown are usually ones that I'm going to put up for sale. Um, and it's not that they don't turn out to be spectacular adults. It's just my preference on what I like for Sumatrans is different and so in order to keep making stuff that I like which is my goal I have to hold back the animals that I think are going to you know be be most conducive to whatever my goal is this is uh Sumatran number two you know still still quite a bit of brown down there but I also have to be careful because stuff that comes from Midnight Rider uh, tends to color change a little bit slower, I've noticed, than the stuff I used to produce out of Tux. Um, and so I have, to, I have to be a little bit more patient with it, uh, which is why I haven't rushed to pick holdbacks and all that. Um, because like Midnight Rider took probably two and a half years before he really went black. Um, whereas like Morticia and stuff from that line took about a year and change to where they were pretty blacked out. So I, I have to be a little bit more patient and try to get better at kind of figuring out how they're going to um, change based on how they look as a baby. It's a little bit of a crapshoot, but you know, over time and doing enough clutches, you start to kind of pick up on, on subtle things. I think this one is in shed. Yeah, this one's deep in shed. I think both of these are in shed too. I know this one is. Oh, this one's not. That one is. This one's not. Hi, are you going to be a douche too? And it's funny, you can just see size differences. Some of them just hatched bigger. Um, you know, this is a bigger baby than the last couple. Why? Who knows? But, uh, 
this is one that I like quite a bit. I think this one's going to really, really jet black for me. So probably keep this one and see what happens. All of these are going to go very dark. That's the beauty of Sumatrans, especially Sumatrans from good lineage. Um, you're going to get darkening. It's just a matter of how much and how long it takes. Uh, but I, uh, I'm very, very excited about that, that animal there. Um, and then this is my holdback female T-positive 007. Like I said, I just already bumped her up since she's staying here. Um, so this is the female that I did keep. Brian got the other one. And, uh, are we having a day? Are we? You'll be fine. You can kind of see the pinks on her head and neck. That's one of those things that is just so hard to capture on camera, uh, be it, you know, a picture or thing, because basically from the tip of her nose to about here is very, very pink. Would it be a major difference if you bred a ball python and a blood python? I, uh, I am not uh, the legit real Dave Kaufman. I am not a um, fan of hybrids, especially within the short tail complex. Um, I People have done it. People have done hybrids of balls to these guys. I think they're really ugly. Um, everybody has different opinions on it, and that's cool. That's what makes the world go around. Um, body structure-wise, uh, they do seem to do fine. Um, the biggest thing is figuring out what kind of requirements uh yeah you can see some of the pinks hey anna um you can see some of the pinks coming through but just not anything close to actual i mean that's like all salmon pink through there um but yeah she's she's pretty good um you know i'm excited to work with her have a female of these. Of course, this was the year I wanted to stay away from the 007s and get more GoldenEye stuff. So I figured last year I did um, T-positive 007 to T-positive Matrix. So obviously I got more T-positive 007s than I got GoldenEye because there's more Matrix floating around that pairing. So this year I went to the T-positive to eliminate Matrix coming in from one side and... Um, yeah, they do have some similar markings depending. That's that's definitely possible. I'm sorry, I thought you were saying their body structure would make them hybridize well. But um the uh yeah, no, I know some of the pink does, just not enough. Like it's one of those things if you could see it in person versus what you're seeing now, you'd be like, oh okay. Uh I get it. Because you're seeing like light, subtle pinks, but it's pink. Um but anyhow, so my goal was to get golden eyes. I got one, one fucking golden eye out of 20 babies um, and eight 007s, which if you're looking at it from like a money standpoint or the top tier of the genetic combination you can make, that's a fucking home run clutch. But of course, that's not what I wanted. I wanted more golden eye stuff. So I held back the one golden eye, but I was hoping to hold back like 1.2 golden eyes from that clutch. And instead I have one male. Um, Blood and short tail, it won't be a big deal, right? They look basically identical. Um, it really, really makes an ugly baby, honestly. Once again, people have done it. Uh, but um, the biggest problem is you really start muddying up bloodlines, and then everybody always says, oh, well, I'm going to sell it as a hybrid and let people know, and maybe you do and maybe you don't. But then does the person that gets it after that say anything? or the person that gets it after that, or does that person breed it? And then those babies that are still hybrids now for the forever, um, are they gonna keep telling everybody? And there was a big problem within Bloods for a long time with Ivories, because when Ivory came out, people were just trying to make Ivories any way they could um, to cash in, because of course, you know, people care about fucking money more than they care about any kind of integrity. And uh, so a lot of people were selling hybrid ivories uh, over the course of time there, and it got really bad for a while. And uh, it seems to have slowed down some, but you could go to most reptile shows that had a decent amount of bloods and short tails and spot a few hybrids that were for sale as one species or the other. Um, I haven't noticed that as, as much 
in the last two to three years, but for a while it, it was like Jesus Christ every time I'm at a show, here's a snake that's clearly a hybrid that's being sold as a blood or as a short tail. Um, you know, they're, they're three distinct species, so just because they look similar, it's no different than, you know, a retic and a blood. It's, it's actually some retics and some short tails are closer. Uh, hybrids within snakes are not usually sterile. Um, there's a, there's a lot of them that breed. They get a lot of fertility issues just because, you know, especially when you look at hybrids, there's, there's, there's a whole conversation to be had there. If you have, you know, something like gabinos that occur naturally because ranges overlap, they're similar species, they're in the same type of environment, those tend to do really well because of whatever, but when you're talking about like a ball python and a, and a blood python, they're snakes that come from completely different continents in completely different habitat niches that have completely different care requirements. So now when you mix those snakes, how do you figure out what temperature is best for that animal? Do you keep it like a ball python? Do you keep it like a blood python? Do you go somewhere in between? How much of which parent species genetic predisposition to the conditions that they need is within the system? Uh, there's just a lot of things going on there. And you see people do it with um, chondros and like, um, you know, you've seen carpets and ball pythons. Once again, totally different continents, totally different, you know, species. Carpets are arboreal, semi-arboreal snakes. And you got ball pythons that are strictly terrestrial, no matter what one study says about an isolated incident in an isolated population that people cling to for, for dear life. And people also don't understand opportunistic animals going up in a tree does not make it arboreal. Um, you know, it, it's it's going where the food is. If, if all they have available to them is birds, if the ground's flooded and they don't have the access to the burrows they like to go in, they're not able to hunt in their traditional areas that they hunt, then they're going to be opportunistic. Doesn't make them arboreal or semi-arboreal or anything like that. Um, but people just just get too focused on the wrong things and stop looking at the actual science and information. Only one I can think of that is sterile, like 99% of the time are carpondros. Yeah, see, I don't know much about that. I, uh, uh oh, what did I do? I, uh, I have not messed, do you think boa constrictors fall under one of the biggest snakes in the world? Um, I mean, I guess some of them could. They seem to be getting smaller, especially in captivity. Um, but I mean, at one time, you could see routinely eight to 10, maybe even pushing 12 foot animals. So they can get a good size. And as far as strength goes, and obviously anacondas are within kind of the, the boa group there. So they're, they're the largest snake in the world. Um, not the longest, but the largest. Reticulated pythons take the crown for the longest. And then the stuff below those two, kind of, I see different stuff. Burmese, African rock. You know, you start getting into some of the, the scrub species and things like that. Um, you know, there's a lot of stuff in there where things start to get a little bit murkier. But, uh, you know, I don't know. I, um, I think boas are definitely larger snakes. And given how powerful they are, um, I, I do think that novice keepers really need to be educated and understand what they have because that animal around your neck, if it tightens up, they can be curtains for you. They're very strong. And you don't, you don't see me do that with animals. To, traditionally, I don't really put them around my neck. I might let them sit over, but I don't let them ever cross. Yeah, boas, boas just are, uh, do you think, well, I can still grow much more? Yeah, I definitely do. Um, so it's it's weird because she's she's an older animal. She's over 10 years old. But um she definitely grew while she was at Dylan's. And um, you know, it's one of those things when she she was probably still growing here, but I uh you know you see her every day. When you don't see her for a year, I definitely notice the difference. Um but uh but yeah, they uh, snakes have indeterminate growth, so they grow throughout their life. Um it's just the rate of which they grow slows way down. So she still may put on some size, but I don't think she's going to put on significant size. She's always going to be small. Um, you know, the previous rock python female that I had when she passed away was was pushing 
you know, 16 feet. Um, and she may have even been over 16 feet at that point. This girl's never going to hit that size. I don't, I don't see, um, just at her age and, and how little they grow at this age. Um, I don't, I don't really ever see her getting beyond 11 feet. I think that's a stretch. She's just small for whatever reason. Um, and it's, it's such a stark contrast because even now she probably weighs, you know, 20 pounds. And that other female I had was over well over a hundred pounds. So it, it, it's a huge difference for adult females of the same species. But all different things play in a factor. I'm going to need a female CP for me in the future to go with the male from Kara. Yeah, Kara's got some nice stuff. So that'll, that'll be a nice animal. I'm sure. Do you know which clutch your male came from? Or how long ago you got it? You know, I know uh, there was some tank cinder stuff that was floating around. Um, she's got a couple of babies from Incognito that are breeding now, I think, or were within the last couple of years. Um, trying to think of some of the animals she had. Well, I, I've had my African rocks since she came out of Africa as a literal, like basically a newborn. Um, so I've had her her entire life. Um, I don't feed every week um, with snakes like that. There's no reason to their metabolism. That's, that's just too much food. But, um, but yeah, no, I've had her, I, I got her when she fit into the palm of my hand. Um, she was, she was smaller than this snake when I got her. So she's, she's been fed, you know, very routinely and normally uh, she's just small. You know, there's, there's a certain thing with genetics. You can only go so much. So she could be from, you know, a smaller line of rocks. She's not, she's definitely Sabai. She's not Madeline's sister, however you say it, but she's just small. I think there's a huge lack of study on the Afrox given their range. Surely there are some distinct locality differences. Oh yeah, for sure. Um, but in fairness, I don't think there's a lot of people that want to sit out in the wild and deal with uh, adult African rock pythons. Some of them can be super chill, but they don't suffer fools. And if you piss them off, they will let you know. Um, and that's, that's why I like them so much is they don't, they don't take your bullshit. You have to respect those animals. If you don't, they will put you in your place very, very quickly. Um, which is what makes them dangerous to most keepers, dangerous to any keeper really. Um, but obviously if you learn your animals, how to read your animals, how to respect their boundaries, then it is a lot safer than if you can't. Um, there's still always risk with any animal that strong, even mine that's small at her size. If she got around my neck, she can kill me. No questions asked. Uh, that is a very, very powerful animal. Um, out of all the species I worked with pound for pound, I think those are, those are some of the strongest snakes that I've ever worked with. Um, So I, I have kept now, what are you doing? Let me put her back. She's like done with being out for so long. Um, mine was uh, a little bit of a shithead as a baby. Um, she's never bitten me. I've only been bitten by an African rock once. Um, get this guy out. Hey, yeah, hi. Want to come out for a while? Say hi to the folks in the tube. This is my... Uh, T positive Lily from uh, Giant Keeper here. You guys have seen him before. Take him out for a little bit, let him cruise around. Hi, bud. What's up? Those are my glasses. I know I don't usually have them on. See? But um, so the uh, I've owned personally probably at least 15 to 20 rock pythons. Um, at one time, I had quite a few of them working with them every single day. You know, I've been, been working with rock pythons since about 2003. Um, so we're coming up on 20 years and one time I've been bitten. I don't find them to be bitey snakes, to be honest. I just think that they don't put up with people's shit. And if you push their buttons and don't read their body language and respect what they're telling you, they will use their teeth. Um, but they also like to bluff a lot. And so if you start falling for those bluffs and the teeth will follow, if you stand your ground in those bluffs, respect them, but let them know that they're not going to push you around like that. Um, they seem to kind of drop that and, and move on. But I think the mistake most people make is not respecting them. Like my girl now likes to come out of her cage on her own. If you reach in there and take her out, you could put yourself in a situation where she may bite. Um, if you let her come out on her own, she's, she's good. 
Um, she just likes to kind of be in control of the situation within reason. Um, and she's never bitten me for reaching in and taking her out of her cage, but what she will do is like constrict my arm and she'll really grab it tight and she'll just sit there and then my whole arm will turn purple. And she just really lets you know, I'm not pleased with this and, and kind of gives you whatever. Yeah, yeah, I would say by eight feet, rock pythons are legitimately very lethal. Um, they're very, very powerful. Um, you saw years ago an eight foot animal, I don't even know if she was quite eight foot, killed, killed her owner. Um, but you know, he was led her around, around his neck and it's not that the animals want to, to hurt you, but when they get freaked out and something scares them or they just get set into a food mode, although honestly, I've never had a rock python go into, go into food mode um, once they were out ever. They've always seemed to be very intelligent and very perceptive of what's going on. Um, you know, when Dylan had mine, she put him through the ringer and she bit boots, she bit hooks, she bit his carpeting, like she really put him through the ringer, but she never liked strangers. By the end, um, after being there for a year, he was able to work with her pretty, pretty well. Um, but she definitely recognized me right away and went right back to our relationship without any issues. But like if I have somebody come over to my house and try to handle her, she, she's not having that. Uh, she does not tolerate strangers at all. Uh, the only person besides me that's ever really been able to, uh, Hartwig cross jet lineage off the recent TVC posted. Okay, nice. I, I didn't realize it was a brand new acquisition. Ladies and gentlemen, more brighter and clearer compared to short tails promotion, right? That's how you can tell if it's a blood or not. I mean, bloods typically, quality bloods are going to be red. There's a you know, T-positive and Lily, so there's a lot of things affecting how this one looks. But quality blood pythons are going to turn red with age. Um, they're a lot harder to tell as babies, and there's some some blood pythons and Borneos that look very, very close. Some of the orange-head Sumatrans look very, very close. Um, but typically as adults, I, I don't know, it's, it's always hard to describe how you tell them apart. Like, I can just look and know, um, but it's hard to tell you what, um, what exactly you know, I'm, I'm processing, I guess. This this snake, I, I fucking love. He's got so much purple. So happy with this animal. Worth every penny. Uh, can't wait till he gets a little bit bigger and he's starting to make babies of his own. Plus, he's just such a cool guy. Um, he's been chill from day one. And they, they told me he was chill. But he uh, he's just so cool. He's always curious. He's always checking everything out. You're going to fall, dude. That's not on me. That's on you. I'm not moving. You're moving. Um, but yeah, no, it was very cool that she remembered me like that because I, I didn't know, you know, I don't know how long these animals memory banks go. And, you know, we, we understand that they're smarter than a lot of people think, but we don't necessarily, uh, yes, my bill is very high, uh, $452 this past month. And I live in the dark. I don't turn lights on for anything. I try to limit to two loads of laundry a week. Um, I don't cook very often at home anymore, so that's just basically them. Um, and that's not my heat either. My heat's oil, so that's a separate bill. I just filled my tank today for 800 and something bucks. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I'm trying to get that purple in there. It's so hard to capture. Can you turn this way for a minute? Of course not. Here we go again with the one-way turns. But you can, you can see some of the purple on him pretty clearly right there. Still doesn't show up true purple on the camera, but I think you can tell enough from the difference of the reds to see to see where that is and the real saturated red on the side of his face. And he's only a year and change old too, so he's still got some coloring up to do. But um, but yeah, so I mean, I've worked with a lot of rock pythons, um, and all of them but two were wild caught. So you know, my one now is is from the wild originally. Um, the only two I had that were captive bred and, and the one, the only one that bit me was one of the captive bred ones. Um, but I mean, I got some, some animals that were quite sizable that came out of the wild. Uh, I had some that were problems for other people that I took in and they just seemed to do good with me. You know, I just, I really, um, pride myself in the ability to kind of read my animals and figure out what's going on in their head sometimes before they do and try to anticipate potential issues and try to, understand how I can develop a working relationship with each animal in here 
on their terms that they're going to be comfortable and we can get to a point where, you know, either like this, I can do whatever I want, or like that T positive 007 female that's high strung. Um, you know, there's a part of me that kind of hopes she doesn't sell because when she does, she's going to transition again and she's going to have to start from square one. And I think she's going to be a handful for somebody for a while uh, because the older they get, the harder it is for them to kind of adjust to change like that. Um, whereas I think within another few months that her and I will be pretty good. But I just really am tailoring everything I do to her and how I think she's best going to kind of handle uh, whatever we're doing. And so... Like I said, I don't care about getting bit. I can just reach in there and pick her right up and I can get lit up 16 times. I don't care. But that teaches her that I am a threat. By getting her to the point where she's biting, she has decided that that's her defense right now, that she has no choice but to do that. And so I feel very strongly that the best thing you can do to build good relationships with the animals is never, ever push them to that point that they feel like that's the only option they have. These animals will give you warnings. They're going to posture. They're going to vocalize. They're going to do things with their tongue, with their eyes, with their head movement. So if you read that body language and you respect it and use that to stop what you're doing, back up, give them the space they need, give them the time they need. If it's just a, a time thing where you just startled them and they need to process and think. Once you force them to react, they're no longer thinking they're reacting. You've, you've crossed a line you can't uncross. Um, and obviously, that doesn't mean I haven't gotten bit by animals. You know, that doesn't mean I haven't missed a signal or a cue. That doesn't mean sometimes you don't get the cue. Sometimes something just freaks them out and instantly they react. They're animals. They have instincts. They're going to do things like that. Um, but by and large, like an animal like this, to me, he's very, he's very predictable. So see, you know, he just got a little nervous there. But he's thinking. He goes, oh, it's just him. Not a threat. He didn't just react to it because we've built a relationship where I have that level of respect for him where he's going to give me the benefit of the doubt that, oh, you know what, this this is fine, you know, and I, I don't do things to disrespect him. So when something like that does accidentally happen, it's not a big deal. But if this is a high strung animal, even if I've worked up to that relationship level and that same little bump happens, it can be enough to set that animal back because that animal's predisposed personality is to default to that that level. This animal probably hatched out and was probably calm from the beginning would be my guess. Um, you know, because he's not that old. I just love that purple. It's so cool. I'm sorry, I'm trying to hold your head so your purple shows. But yeah, I really like him. Really looking forward to working with him. Sorry, I saw some more comments go by. Yeah, I mean, like I said, all of mine were wild caught except for the that pair of captive bred babies I got, um, and all of them were fine. I handled them regularly. Um, the one thing that you you got to be careful with is like taking those animals outside, um, because that can really set them back into that survival mode or or defensive mode. And the biggest thing is giving them time. You know, when I got my baby and she was defensive, I didn't handle her for like six months. And don't give me, that doesn't mean she's sitting in a dirty cage for six months. I'm still cleaning her, but maybe I'm moving her with a hook. Maybe I'm, you know, letting her crawl out of the container on her own and put herself in another container while I'm cleaning her cage. Um, you know, there's things you can do where you're not hands on and not pressuring that animal into that situation of being defensive. And even if it does get into that situation, it's blaming the hook. It's blaming whatever else is tight. It's not blaming you. And so that's the biggest thing is if you do have to get a little invasive with an animal that is nervous, make it focus something else other than you being the cause of that discomfort and that nervousness. And so that really, really helps translate in building that animal's trust because you're never violating that animal's trust in its mind. It's the hook. It's the paper towel roll. It's whatever else that, that maybe it's got a problem with. Um, so there's, there's ways to do things without getting hands on. And sometimes you have no choice for the safety of an animal. Maybe you have to restrain it to do something. And unfortunately, that's just a reality of keeping. And sometimes you're going to have to do things that are going to set you back. But the biggest thing, especially with an animal like this, if he bites, it doesn't hurt. So who cares? So don't go in thinking, oh, my God, he's going to bite me. Like, okay, he bites you. Life goes on. Um, but if you think you're going to get bit and all of a sudden, like he's got my face, all of a sudden you go like this and you start doing things and reacting in a way that tells him something's off, 
then you're going to put yourself in a situation where you probably are going to get bit now because now you're telling the animal something's wrong. You're nervous. You're sending that energy, nervous energy. I don't care if this snake comes up right now and, and hits me in the side of the head as he's crawling. I'm not going to think like, oh, he's going to bite me. because If he bites me, one, I don't care. And two, I have, I have trust in him. And so I have given him trust in order to earn trust. And, and, and like I said, an animal like this is not a good example because from the moment I got him, he's been super chill. Um, so this is an animal that I really had to earn much with. He's just super calm and it just makes it super easy for both of us. Now, the fact that he's so personable and everything else is, is great because there's going to be super calm animals that just don't give a shit about you um, and don't really want to be handled. And that's fine, too. So you have to respect that. You know, we have to understand that as much as we might be getting this animal for a pet and want to handle it all the time, if the animal doesn't like that, then you've got to respect that. If you want to have a lasting relationship, if you want to have this animal for 20, 30 years um, and let it live, you know, the best life it can live without an abundance of stress, then you got to do that. He's chill. He's probably going to fall asleep now. Anybody have anything else before we uh, sign off here? Dun, dun, dun. The neck thing always bothers me. They don't have arms or legs. They literally hold on to things by squeezing. Yeah, it's it's just not a it's not a smart idea. And the sad thing is, most people do it because it gets a reaction. It's the same as people that want to take pictures of themselves free handling venomous. It's like they're not doing it for the animals. They're doing it for their own ego and their own you know whatever. It's the biggest overall snake you have. Um. Probably right now it's between my olive female and the southern white lip, and I would say it's probably the southern white lip. He's probably the largest. Uh, the largest blood python is my, my T-positive female. There's a bunch of videos on the channel of her. You can find her pretty easily on here. Um, she's my biggest blood or short tail. But yeah, I would say the southern white lip, and he's on, he's on the channel at least in a few videos. There's two. I had two southern white lips for a while. Now I'm down to the one. Don't go in my mouth. Huh? Um... Yeah, that happened a few times where you get the tongue up the nostril or in your mouth while you're talking, in my eye. Um, and I've had a lot of people surprised that I let bloods and short tails in my face. But if I have trust in this animal, then I don't, I don't see the problem. Uh, favorite non-short tail experience. Are you asking me my favorite non-short tail experience? Maybe the biggest white lip ever. I mean, I got to imagine there's bigger ones out there, but he's pretty fucking big. <laughs> Um, I have not seen a lot that size. Everybody I go over their house that has Southern white lips or see their Southern white lips like, oh, that's my big Southern white lip. That thing's like two and a half feet smaller than mine. Um, but yeah, he's, he's, he's a big boy. Do I eat chips every day? Uh, no, I do not eat chips every day. I actually barely ever eat chips. Um, I'm not much of a snack person at all. Today I had a bacon, egg, and cheese on an everything bagel for breakfast. I had a uh, protein bar for a snack at work. I had Jamaican curry chicken for lunch. And then I had sushi for dinner. Um, and that's it. And I, I don't eat late. So usually by like 5 or 6 I eat and I'm done until like 8 the next morning. Um, favorite non-short tail experience. Is this like personal experience within my collection or are we opening up to any any snake experience ever are you like comfortable you want to go up there yeah oh that was gonna say that's one of those slidey shirts man ain't gonna work ain't gonna work yeah i gotta gotta give me my criteria here so i can try to figure it out mostly i'm just trying to buy time so i can think i eat chips every day that was a fucking interesting question My one snack of choice would be ice cream, but uh, I don't have it very often because one, I'm lactose intolerant, so it kills me. And two, uh, I just don't really buy snacks. Believe it or not, for a fat person, I actually don't really eat that terrible. I just have fucking horror genetics. And if I even think about food, it just goes. Good night, Dina. Good to see you. Any snake experience. Man, any time that I get to like share space with, you know, really big animals that really have the potential to kill me, I always think that's kind of a, 
a special experience because you're really putting your life in that animal's hands and you're trusting that if you respect that animal, it's going to respect you. Um, and I think there's some kind of power in that experience. So anytime you're handling like a really big anaconda or a big rock python, but I, I would say probably the big female rock python that I did, ha did have, um, I really think she taught me a lot about snakes in general, a lot about larger animals, a lot about um, how, how forgiving they can be because I, I made a lot of mistakes with her for sure. Um, and not necessarily like care mistakes, but you know, I'd have her out or whatever. I'd be cleaning something, not paying attention. And for a, a 130 pound snake, she would still get underfoot. Like you, you, I can't tell you how many times I actually stepped on her or kicked her, like trying to back up doing things. And she just took it all in stride. Never once huffed, hissed, you know, took any offense to it. Um, just, just really taught me a lot though. She was, she was really personable animal. She was really, really inquisitive and intelligent, always thinking about everything going on around her. Are you planning on collabing with other YouTubers other than Jason's exotics? Um, I mean, I've done some other things, but as far as collabing goes, there's not a lot of people local to me. Um, so I'm willing to, depending on the person, I, uh, you know, I mean, I, I go up to, to, I used to go up to Nerd quite a bit. I've shot quite a few videos up there, but I, uh, reptiles are the closest thing. Well, I don't know. There could be an argument that birds are the closest thing too, but um, I, uh, I don't know. I mean, I liked dinosaurs as a kid. I was afraid of snakes as a kid, obviously. That's changed. Um, but I definitely think some people would transition from there. Everybody has different things. Thanks, Darren. Appreciate that. Um, but uh, what was the question I was answering before? I'm getting too many questions and getting distracted here. Oh, the, the, the collab thing. So it's tough for me because a lot of, a lot of the YouTube people that are really focused on YouTube um, kind of do too much bullshit for me to be involved with, to be frank. Um you know, uh, just the way they treat the animals, the animals are really like a secondary or, or third, you know, thought process to, to, to them. It's, it's maybe clout they're chasing or, you know, just, just doing a lot of bonehead stuff that's not really responsible for the hobby and not really responsible to the animals. And so I try to be careful who I do stuff with because I look at everything where, you know, by bringing somebody on my channel or going on to someone else's channel, that's that's an endorsement of sorts. And there are some gray areas. I've done some some podcasts and, and YouTube programs and things with people that maybe I'm not super, super crazy about some of the things they do. But I also look at it from the hobby perspective in that, you know, maybe I can go on there and be a voice of reason for these animals and explain things a little bit different way for that person's audience who probably doesn't watch my content or watch similar content because they're looking for that flash flare, whatever it is, because, you know, let's be frank, my channel is, is not for the vast majority of YouTube people, even amongst the snake community, because the vast majority of people that have one or two pet snakes um, don't care about deep diving into education and lineage and all this kind of stuff that I like to focus on. They don't really, like, I don't want to say they don't care about the care of their animal, but they care more about the flash, the flare, the sensationalism, the like, oh, it's going to bite me. And, oh, you know, like I have 250 something videos on here. I don't think I've been bitten once on, on YouTube. Um, and I haven't been bitten once filming for YouTube. It's not like I cut it away and wouldn't show it if I got bit. Um, you know, obviously if I took a particularly nasty bite that I thought was kind of bad for the hobby, I would, uh, um, probably not post that content for that reason. Um, but it's, it's just not happened. Um, I did get bit once on a Facebook live by my female olive python. She bit and wrapped me while we were sitting on the couch, um, which wasn't a big deal. She bit me in the arm, wrapped me up, but, uh, but yeah, so you know, that, that's a big thing to me because a lot of these people that are getting bit on YouTube are getting bit because they're doing things to get that animal to bite them, whether you notice it or not. Uh, in the way they're handling them, uh, in the fact that they don't have relationships with these animals, and the fact that they don't respect what relationship that animal is trying to establish with them. Um, and so I really don't like that. 
So I, I don't, and it frustrates me because you get those people like, oh, you're trying to hide that aspect of the hobby. Absolutely not. Like I said, I've never cut any footage for, for getting bit. Um, you know, I, I just haven't. But I respect my animals. I know my animals. If I know an animal is going to bite and going to be defensive, why am I going to take it out? Why am I going to put that animal through that for entertainment purposes? That, that doesn't benefit the animal. doesn't benefit the hobby. Who does it benefit? Nobody. The only person that benefits is the person getting bit in that point because they're using it as a selling point to get views and, and you know, try to make money off of this as opposed to thinking about the big picture and educating people on, on the fact that these animals are really cool. I mean, you know, if, if people could get past the fear aspect that they have, the fact that you can sit here with an animal that's not designed to be social, that's not designed to depend on other beings for its survival, to choose to spend time with you, to choose to be in the same space as you. And I, and I get choices is relative because we're keeping them in a cage. You know, if they were wide open, would it, would it leave and, and never come back? Um, but I mean, this animal could crawl basically wherever he wants to right now. And he's opting to sleep on my arm or crawl up on my shoulder. He's not trying to get away from me. He's coming towards me. Um, and that's a, a conscious choice that he's, he's making. So to me, that's my probably my favorite aspect of keeping reptiles is the fact that most of these animals aren't built to build relationships with a human being. And the fact that they do, um, you know, it, it, it takes a little bit more to earn it. My dogs are easy to, to earn a relationship with them because they're built to live in a pack setup. They're built to live with and socialize with other animals for their survival. Um, so it's an ingrained, inherent thing within their DNA. To, to be social and to interact with at least their close-knit family members. Whereas this animal is built to basically stay the fuck away from every single other animal unless it's a prey item or it's breeding season. That's it. The rest of its life, it's not designed to, to be spending any time with, with anything. Um, and so the fact that you can get an animal like this to just sit here and, and you know chill, to me that's cool. So that, that's where I, I come from, and that's where my channel is, is coming from. I don't have a reptile, just a cat. Yeah, cats, cats, are, uh, cats are something you can sometimes have to work for a relationship with. Uh, most of that relationship, a lot of the time, is feed me, leave me alone, touch me. Three seconds later, don't touch me. Uh, I know not all cats are like that, but a lot of them are. Um, you know, the one I used to have was very, very, very people-centric. Uh, she couldn't function without people constantly around her. Um, but she's not the, not the norm. Yeah, it's not even, uh, yeah, she was, she was over 15. I, I think she was, the, that rock python was about, probably pushing about 16 and a half when she went. She was a brick shit house. Um, the last pictures I have of her, because of course that was like before everybody having a fucking cell phone camera in their pocket all the time. The last pictures I have of her, she's probably in the 12 to 13 foot range. Obviously I didn't anticipate what happening happening to her. I just, I, I didn't own a camera. So what few pictures I have were from other people that were around with cameras or disposable cameras that I bought at the time. Um, so I don't have a lot of pictures of her. I have very few. Um, but even, even when she was like 12, 13, if you look at the pictures then, She's an impressive animal. She's very big. Um, but yeah, she got she got much bigger before before she passed. And she was probably, you know, she was probably an animal that was pushing, you know, 13, 14 years old at that point in her life. Uh, maybe even older. We don't really know because she was a rescue originally. Um, she originally came into the place that I, I used to work at. Right in my nose, bro. Right in my nose, dude. Off he goes. Um, so she originally came in because the guy purchased her because he thought it would be cool to have her ride on the handlebars of his motorcycle. Totally asinine to anybody with fucking two functioning brain cells. But of course she bit him and he fucking cried and dropped her off. Oh, she bit me. Like, well, you're a fucking asshole. So that's why. <laughs> Never bit me. Do you think you can successfully tame a king cobra if you work with it daily when it is very young until it gets used to you? Because I saw a video of a guy who had a pet copperhead. That was nice. Uh, a friend of mine has a copperhead that's super chill, super chill. Um, and, the, and the reality is a, a venomous snake 
is no different than a non-venomous snake as far as like ability to build a relationship with it, tame it, all that. It's just that if you make a mistake, if something happens, it's much, much greater chance of you losing your life. Um, so it is a much bigger risk. And, you know, like I say with animals like this, you've got to give trust to get trust, to give trust to an animal that if it does bite you, can kill you, um, is a lot different uh, level of experience and a lot different risk factor. And in a lot of senses, kind of foolish, but you can absolutely tame King Cobras. There's a bunch of people. Dylan has Dax. Um, don't get me wrong. Dax is a very dangerous animal. Dylan would be the first to tell you that, but Dax is super chill. Uh, I've been over there with him out. He doesn't even know me and he's fine with me. Um, you know, he, I've never handled him per se, but I'm around him. He's He's got access to me and he doesn't come after me or anything, but he's great with Dylan. Um, but he's he's an animal and in a second, something can scare him, spook him and he can react. And he's a large animal. I don't know how big he is right now. The last time I was over there, I would say he was over, probably over 11 feet. Um, he's definitely getting big. Um, but um, what's his name? Chris uh, Sweet there or whatever over, I think he's over in like Thailand. He's got a couple of kings that are pretty chill. Um, uh, he's got he's got quite a few. He's got a few that are a little touch and go, um, but he's a very, very confident snake handler. He's worked a lot with those animals. And to be honest with King Cobras, they're very intelligent. So I don't even think... Obviously, starting from a baby, you, you have a lot better chance of, of it being easier to build a relationship because that's all that animal knows is you. But you can get a king cobra later on in life and you can build a relationship with that animal because they're intelligent. Uh, you know, you you will eventually get to a point of mutual respect. And some, some may never completely tame down, but you could probably get to a, a pretty good working relationship um, with, with most of them, especially if you're confident and comfortable handling them. That's the biggest thing. A giant reticker berm or anaconda is basically like having a venomous snake because if something happens, the snake can overpower and kill you instantly. Yeah, it is It is somewhat similar, and I don't want to downplay the danger of that, but the, the ability of those animals, if you're handling them properly, to get the jump on you without you being able to prevent yourself getting into a serious situation um, is pretty low. It's when people are stupid and put them around their neck or lean into the enclosure and expose themselves in a way they can't protect themselves. But if that snake bites you on the arm, you know, it's, it's not gonna kill you. It would take some really, really bad luck uh, for that to happen. Uh, it's not impossible and they, they command respect, but it's a lot different than something that can just tap you like that and, and now you're fucked. Um, you know, that snake has to constrict and they don't constrict with lightning speed. And like I said, if you don't put yourself in a position where you can't protect yourself, um, usually you're pretty good. And obviously, if you're handling a snake that size, you should have somebody else around. You know, obviously being an owner of an animal, so there are times where you have to work with the animal alone. But there's there's safety protocol that you need to follow and need to be diligent with and not get complacent. Um, and you'll see a lot of people that keep both venomous and non-venomous and they don't handle their non-venomous like this. They handle everything as if it's venomous because their concern is eventually they'll fucking kind of fall asleep at the wheel and just grab a venomous snake away they would a non-venomous and get tagged. And so by having a consistent approach with all species, um, they feel like that's their best way to safely interact with their animals. Um, I've kept venomous, I've, I've handled venomous, I haven't in a long time. I mean, I, at Dylan's house a couple times when we're filming and stuff, I've moved some snakes around or whatever, but I haven't really like worked a venomous snake in this house or anything. I haven't in, in quite some time. And I can't say that I wouldn't, it would depend on the species. Um, but, uh, but I'm not in a position right now where I would be comfortable like, like going to his house and taking care of his venomous collection while he went away or something because I haven't worked with those animals in over a decade now and uh i'm so used to these guys where you know if i get bit i get bit i don't care and um like i said I, I avoid it for the animal's sake and putting them in that situation but if they get into a situation where they tag me i'm not it's it's oh well you bleed a little life goes on i just hit you in the face there bud sorry um but yeah so it, it's it's similar but different um, still, still an animal you need to respect, still an animal perfectly capable of taking your life, but 
you got a little bit more room for error. Spot on, my cat won't leave me alone when I'm when I am home. Not a problem, just not a typical cat. Yeah, no, mine was the same way. And she would leave the room and then cry that you didn't follow her. Like, it's like, dude, I have things to do besides follow the cat around the house. You can follow me. Um, but she didn't, she didn't want to work that way. All right, I'm going to cut this short. We've been on here for over a couple hours now. And I want to fucking settle down and get ready for bed. So I appreciate you guys coming out. Um, we'll see you again hopefully soon. I need to get back into the swing of making videos. Life's just been kind of all over the place and crazy and... My, my mental state and motivation has not been focused on stuff like this. I've been trying to kind of focus all my energy on getting the animal squared away. Thanks, Sean. Um, we'll see you guys soon, especially you guys that are members. I got to do a video with you guys soon. Uh, we're overdue for that. You as well, Tyler. Thank you. Um, we'll see you guys. Appreciate all the questions and interactions. Um, and we'll see you guys again soon. Don't forget if you're looking for something. Thanks, Justin. Good night. Um, if you're looking for something, don't forget to check out Morph Market. Follow me on Instagram if you don't already. Same name, Damagano Snakes. Very easy to find. Um, Instagram is probably the best place to follow me to see consistent snake content. Thank you, Selena, because uh, that's basically what my Instagram is. is like memes in my story and snakes and occasionally other stuff going on in life. Good night, Anna. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Anybody who didn't hit the like button, don't forget to do that. Please, please, please helps uh, push this video out. I think I got everybody that said goodbye and good night. Uh, goodbye to the legit real Dave Kaufman, even though he didn't say goodbye. Thank you for all your questions. Before you go, can you touch on racks versus enclosures? Um, so that's a, that's a really long involved question to really dive into. But to be very brief, uh, both have their uses. I firmly feel that bloods and short tails do better in rack setups and in tub setups than they do in caging. Um, I feel on the contrary, my olive pythons, white lips, stuff like that do better in the cages. Um, but there are individual animals that need, you need to tailor to them. It's not, you know, one size fits all. Bloods can be kept in enclosures. I just don't like the way that I see them interact with that environment compared to the way I see them interact with this. Oh, my dog's out there drinking water. I'm like, what the hell is that noise now? Um, they've been sleeping forever. I'm surprised they're up. It's probably Janka. But, uh, but yeah, so both have their uses. And I think if you're keeping like one or two short tails, it's not practical to have a heated room. It's a little bit tougher to heat um, bins like, you know, these, these Christmas tree tubs here. Um, when you don't have a heated room with a heated room, it's very easy and I can throw supplemental heat under there on a thermostat when I have gravid females in there. It's super easy in a situation like this, but I have a lot of snakes in this room. There's, there's over a hundred animals in this room right now. So, um, you know, it, it really depends, but I, I find mostly by species, I have my stuff, stuff broken down. Uh, my water pythons I found do better in racks. These guys I found do better in racks. My McLoss python loves being in a cage compared to a rack. He's a totally different snake in there. Uh, my rat snake loves being in a cage. Um, the, uh, you know, my rock python's in a cage. The olives are in a caging. Uh, the white lips in caging. Um, the spotted pythons, when I had them, were in caging. Um, so it really, it really just depends. And with a lot of those species I just listed, they're semi-arboreal animals. And so the caging works better because I can do a little bit more height. These guys are completely terrestrial. They shouldn't be climbing. So it makes it uh, really easy. Uh, she's just uh, what you would call an Eastern rat snake now. Um, I guess she's also called a rusty rat um, or something. I, my friend produced her locally and uh, I love rat snakes. And so I, I, um, she gave her to me when she was young and she's been here for a few years now, I think. I think I've had her for... I think the summer will be three years maybe um but she's in a four foot cage now and uh, hopefully that cage will last another couple years she's kind of hitting her like adult growth spurt right now so she's over four feet but um supposedly her mom and dad are both good sized snakes so I, I think she has the potential to hit six feet by the time she's all said and done we'll see what happens um i would love that though because there's nothing you know big big rat snakes are really cool and she's got a fantastic personality. She's been on the channel before in a couple of videos. Um, you should be able to find her on here. At least two videos, if not three. 
Um, I'm sure she has a meet the collection. I know I did a, a, an update when I put her into the three foot cage. Now she's in a four foot cage. I don't think I did an update on that. I keep four line and Russian rats. Can we see the rat fight that on summer? Um, I don't, I know she's been on the channel before. I don't know if, if there's videos with her on there now. If the video with my top five species I'm keeping right now is up, she's on there. Um, she's in shed right now. I'm not going to take her out right now, but down the line, maybe. Um, I'll show her off some more. But uh, her temperament's fine. She's very easy to handle. She doesn't give me any problems. Um, you know, as long as I respect her, she respects me. Uh, working with her outside is touch and go sometimes. She was really good in the video I shot, but sometimes she can be a handful outside. She's gotten up a tree on me before. I don't really take her outside very much anymore um, just because, you know, she's big enough now where when she gets the high ground, it's it's a pain in the ass to get her out of there. So, uh, and she's, she's quick when she wants to be. Um, the day she got up the tree on me, I, uh, I literally, she started to get a little bit of an attitude. I had, I always had my hook nearby. I turned around, picked my hook up and turned back around. She was gone and she was up a tree, um, so fast. So it was, it was a pain in the ass. Um, I ended up having to actually cut part of the tree down to get her out cause I couldn't get up to where she was. Um, so she was banned from outside for a long time after that day. And then I took her out a few times since then. And she's, she's been pretty good. Um, but I'm still careful because she can she can turn when she's out there and decide she doesn't want to play nice. All right, I'm signing off. I'm tired. Thank you, guys. We'll see you again. One more reminder to hit that like button if you haven't yet. It'd be nice to see one more like before I go. 14 of you in here still. I'm sure one of you didn't do it. Oh, 13, we lost a person. That's awesome. I really like rat snakes. Only big snakes I keep are doom rolls boas. I had a doom rolls boa about... To probably 12, 13 years ago, um, but I ended up selling it. Say goodnight, bud. Say goodnight to the people on the on the YouTube. Look at that purple. One more like. Come on, somebody's got one out there for it. All right, guys, we'll see you later. Um, if you enjoyed the video, feel free to share the video or any video on the channel. Always helps. And we'll see you guys again.